Hello. We're here with Zero Books Basement discussing capital. Uh, and we're here to discuss arguably the most important chapter of all chapters in Capital Volume 1, and maybe the most important chapter in all volumes of Capital, though, you know, the one on the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in Volume 3 does give some competition. Uh, chapter 25, The General Law of Capitalist Accumulation. And today we'll be discussing the first four or five sections of that chapter, uh, amounting to uh, 40 pages, page 762 to 802 in the Penguin Folks edition of Capital. Uh, and today, here we have uh, Elliot Rosenstock, the imaginary, Conrad Hamilton, the symbolic, and last but not least, if you know your Lacan, uh, Ernesto Vargas, the real. Uh, oh. And he's, he hopefully has some very, very real and authentic uh, narratives about industrial labor in Mexico to share with us uh, of today. I hope so. Uh, the Industrial Reserve <laughs> Army is here, yes. present and reporting for duty. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. It's, it's a big thing. Relevance. <laughs> uh, before we kick it off, do you guys have anything that you want to say about the chapter or um, uh, any observations, any thoughts? Uh, I think it, I think this sort of goes, it, it was interesting to see Marx go away from Hegel and into the subject object um, distinction with the technical aspect of capital. So to sort of, um, I think Marx is kind of an unpredictable thinker that way. And, uh, yeah. um, so you, you know, he's not afraid to, he's not, a, you know, he doesn't sort of fetishize a certain school of philosophy, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So he, he's not afraid to sort of say like, oh, and here I'm using the kind of Descartes, you know, dualism. Uh, mm -hmm. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, to say go away from, from Hegel, it it does, be yeah. deceiving because like, of course, internal to Hegel's system are all kinds of things which, um, you know, are descriptive with respect yeah. to the process. Although he of has been subject and object, yeah, Hegel has. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would, I would tend to interpret it that way. I mean, for me, probably the most coherent um, reading of Marx is that, I mean, you, you'd you certainly say in a way he's a Hegelian. I mean, not unequivocally, of course, that you'd have to attach some certain qualifiers, but in a way he's also a Kantian, right? You know, because of the scission that's imposed in the structure of reality by the commodity form, right? Yeah. You know, use value, exchange value, you know, alienation of labor and all of these things, right? So it's like there, there's, there's, a, there's a dualism there uh, that's incredible to the way the system's structured. Right? And that's part of what, you know, he's challenging, right? Because there's a certain unity um, that communism is supposed to usher in. Right. Yeah. right. I felt that um, the distinctions that Marx says at the, at the beginning of the chapter between the value composition and the technical composition of capital, I thought people tend to overlook those a lot when we're talking about um, the development of the means of production. I was um, listening to a stream, you guys know, uh, Muk, mm -hmm. I don't know. No, 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 no. no. He's I've, a, heard of, I've heard of him. He's a left com Twitter. Yeah. Um, Twitter mm -hmm. guy. Um, he's a he's from 4chan, lefty poll. I don't know. He has a long, from, long. What does that even mean? You're from? I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. You can. Uh, I'm sure he can. Is that where he's from? Yeah. Right. He's maybe. From the, he was from maybe. an image from an image board from an image maybe. board hospital. Yeah. I had no <laughs> idea they had such a robust. <laughs> they had such right. a robust system. Right. <laughs> so he was saying that he feels that um, I was watching his stream yesterday, that he feels that um, we're ready to take over the means of production, right? That mm -hmm. it's already developed well enough, that production is already solved. All we have to do is just revolution and take over, right? Well, and I, I feel that this chapter really, lately, yeah, of course, I don't know, I don't know about that either. Um, but yeah, this chapter really makes me refle reflect on, how, on, that, on the fact that we have to um, drill down on the, on the technical composition of capital, right? On on how it's technically composed, not just in the United States and in Europe, but in the rest of the world. And if we don't focus on on advancing that and on, and on having programs that specifically advance that, we really can't create the kind of society that we want. Yeah, I mean, the idea that the productive forces, you know, and Marx talks about this, there's technical forces, but that's only part of it in terms of the social social forces as well. So you can't say, oh, because Amazon exists, um, all we need is revolution and to take it over. Because right. I think when you talk, when you go into the realm of one party leftism, right, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
or one party fa fascism right wing, you know, um, <laughs> you, you have to think about who is this one party and what will their values be, right? I think, you know, in America especially, you could say the left is kind of the social democratic um, representational left. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what's the biggest contingent with the most force and the most people on the streets, you could say like um, Black Lives Matter adjacent social democracy, right? Um, right. So yeah, so it's it's who so the idea that we just have to do a revolution and then take over. I think I think it's more worth to talk about uh, what exactly are the so the uh, the mm -hmm. the roles that the laborer can't, should have to their labor, uh, right? Well, you have you mm -hmm. have you have means of production. You have right, relations of production. I mean, it seems to me that one um, characteristic feature of a lot of um, post-World War II thought, and I think the situation has played a really, really important role here, um, was in critiquing um, the uh, the relations of production, right? right? In terms of how those played out, right? Because like you got, if you look in like the 50s and 60s, you have a situation where, um, you know, the remuneration for labor, right, is moving in a kind of approximate correspondence with the increased productivity of labor, right? So under those kind of conditions, I mean, there's only, I mean, of course you can complain, but the complaint can only go so far with respect to a lack of remuneration, right? Right. Um, so like when the when the situationist kind of came on the scene, you know, and I know Doug loves this stuff too, um, you know, though he sort of, you know, transcended it somehow, um, you know, part of their, their, you know, they said, well, our critique is a critique of everyday life, something which has hitherto not been critiqued. And in a way, I think they were one of the only groups that were able to um, successfully foresee like May 68 in France because of that. Because, you know, for a lot of people who are adhering to a more orthodox understanding of Marxism, they're like, well, people are being paid more in relation to gains in productivity. So why would there be this kind of, you know, dramatic revolutionary outbreak? And I think in a lot of respects, it was motivated by a sense of a lack of control, right? So we're looking at, mm -hmm. at relations of production. Um, I think if you look at something like accelerationism, of course, which comes along after 07, 08, uh, I think that was an attempt to kind of, you know, go beyond, because the thing is situationism ends up, I think, influencing a lot of people in ways that aren't even fully recognized, um, like Foucault, uh, Baudrillard, Lyotard, and so on. Right, you know, and post-structuralism in general, with the focus on discursivity. Um, but then I think after 0708, with accelerationism, you have kind of moved back to discussing um, means of production, right? You know, because and that's because you've kind of, you know, you went back to this more in a way, mark like archetypally Marxist situation, um, where you had more and more accumulation of capital, but worker salaries were not raising, you know, in relation to. What a surprise! <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, but then that, but then, so then you get people like, you know, Cernicek and Williams saying, and actually this is what Stiegler critiqued when we, when I had a conversation with him about accelerationism, they'll say like, well, we just need yeah. to nationalize Amazon. We need to am nationalize Facebook. Now I'm not saying that's wrong, um, yeah, but this, this might be a little bit underdeveloped um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, I mean, Marx says the field of application of machinery will not be the same under communism as under capitalism. Of course. Right. So there has to be a reconceptualization. So I feel like you kind of get two bad extremes, right? A kind of bad mm -hmm. infinity. Right, if you're looking at that kind of post-structuralist angle and then some of the limitations of the accelerationist angle as it was sort of concisely put forth by Cernicek and Williams, right? Mm -hmm. Someone says Cernicek and Hester. Now Hester's a xenofeminism. You could say left, it's left wing accelerationism, but proper left, I wouldn't know, I don't know if she would consider herself. She's, but she's famously a xenofeminist. Unless I'm totally mistaken, I'm like, like totally like, <laughs> Yeah, well, one of the, one of the, one of the, I think the, I, I'll get into summarizing the chapter in a minute, by the way. One of the things I want to say that I guess I'm a bit disappointed in about um, with the development, and I think these are, were all like really, really important, you know, um, philosophical currents, but one thing I'm a bit disappointed of with in terms of the development of accelerationism, left accelerationism, mm -hmm. let's say, yeah. is like it was very, very influenced by Ray Bradzio, who's a very bright guy. Um, but mm -hmm. I feel like one consequence of that is like they're using a, but they're trying to combine like a Marxist theory of the economy with like a sort of theory of um, epistemology that's coming out of philosophy of mind. So yeah, and they do. Sorry. Yeah, the accelerationist group tends to fetishize their own signifiers. And, uh, you know, their critique, that group critiques zero books pretty hard because, you know, Mark Fisher obviously um, created repeater books. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I read something by a, you know, Zeno Gothic. I think we went, we went back and forth on Twitter once. Yeah. Now we just don't, <laughs> don't communicate. But I think he still, he remembers that a little bit. 
So he he did like a hardcore critique of like zero books and as the bread tube adjacent, he's like, what a disgrace to Mark Fisher or something. Um, or it does, but I think what, what my critique of him would be his fetishization of, um, you know, the signifier is given by neo-reactionaries. And I think that carries across all of those British accelerationists, which is they really, really fetishize these fragmentation ideas. Um, and they're, you know, they, they are not willing to um, critique these hardcore right wing reactionary ideas and they try to incorporate it into their left wing, quote unquote, left wing ideologies. And it just doesn't work. Um, well, that, well, that's one thing. I mean, talking about philosophy of mind. Which is Mark this, Fisher did as well. Like, keep in mind, Mark Fisher was like, this is why Nick yeah. Land's still good, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think one of the issues, like, one of the things I see about it is that, like, I think that if you look at the stance that Zero Books has taken, I feel like, you know, because I think one of the main problems you're going to have to solve if you're looking at Marxism is like, from a philosophical standpoint, is like, what is the Marxist theory of knowledge? What is the theory of epistemology? And maybe we could say schematically that prior to World War II, you, like empiricist reflection theories are more common, like Lenin and empiricism and material criticism. Maybe after World War II, you could say rationalist theories like that of Althusser and Bhaskar were more common. Mm -hmm. But I, the one thing I see is that as being a rift, is that it seems like if you look at like um, Doug Lane, like if you look at his love of Postone, um, if you look at myself, like my love of, of Son Rethel, um, you know, I think one thing that you see in, in situations and factors, factors into this is an attempt to actually develop like a Marxist theory of knowledge that's, that's based on the Marxist economic categories, right? And I think if you look at what they're doing um, in, you know, sort of the cool school, whatever, um, you know, these sort of- <laughs> The cool yeah. school. Oh yeah. my God, we got to remember that. Because they really are the cool school. They are, they're like yeah. one of the, I would say their main self-confirming sort of thing is, well, we're the cool school. Let's yeah, be real here, zero books, we're cooler than you. Which and they is, are. Okay. And by, but, they, but they are, but only because cool is composed of belittling people, like to a certain extent, which we don't do, you know, which, so I think we're better. Sure. I mean, I like, I like <laughs> unless, you, unless you construe this as belittling. I mean, I like a lot of those people yeah. and I think they're really vital. Um, <laughs> I just, it depends, like, it depends who we're talking about, right? I'm speaking quite generally yeah. about kind of post acceleration mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Um, but I just mean, I feel like one thing is that, um, you know, they're, they approach it differently in the sense that, you know, Marxism has a great influence, but it's interpreted via the philosophy of mind, right? So they're not trying to um, construct an imminent epistemology of Marxism, right? They're actually looking outside, um, right, to, you know, and, and again, you can look at like the great debt that someone like Brazia has to Wilfred Sellers. Right in terms of doing that, and that kind of gets us back into like what you know um, Plekhanov refers to as like the need for like a Marxist theory of cognition, um, which can be inserted into a dialectical materialist schema and exists outside, like you know the imminent critique of capital, right? Um, so I think there's I think there's a theoretical difference there, and I think I think really like part of what our you know goal should 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 be to uh, to think I'm not going to say necessarily in conformance with like the commodity form or something like that. But to think of like the Marxist theory of knowledge in a way that doesn't rely on theories of the philosophy of mind, right? Which you're doing in your own way, Elliot. With uh, I, I was going to say, like, well, I think clearly we have a different opinion on that because I think I, you know, I'm a I study psychology and I am writing a whole book on a philosophy of mind, but it isn't necessarily a phenomenological philosophy so much as what is self-interest contained and how does one use what mm -hmm. is outside of oneself um, and sort of what is one sort of move towards which is outside so i think the problem with egoism philosophy so far has it's they're all theories of will and vitalist philosophies and mine mm -hmm. is an ego is a non-vitalist egoism so it's very different um, mm -hmm. than both rand or stern stern is obviously a vitalist in his own way rand's obviously a vitalist so part of yeah. it part of it's creating a non-vitalist egoism well i mean i think zero books is pretty friendly to psychoanalysis i mean like but that's what i mean but like whether it's I mean, they, they gave me a shot, fuck. <laughs> whether, whether it's, you have to be whether pretty it, friendly to do that, to yeah. psychoanalysis. Whether it's psychoanalysis, whether it's materialist epistemology, I mean, the point is, like, we're not, when we're, when we're approaching the problem of, like, a Marxist theory of knowledge, we're not doing it from the standpoint of, like, let's say, dominant cognitive strands, right? Which is what I think, you know, you get more in sort of the other camps. Um, so I think that that's an important thing to do and, and, and to continue. Um, but should we summarize this chapter? Yeah, yeah. So let's... Yeah, okay. Now, now that we know everyone's kind of here, we're spitballing a little bit. Uh, okay, so we got four sections. We got to we got to summarize. Yeah. Um, 
So let's do, I, how about, does anyone, I, I can do this or does anyone else want to want to volunteer to summarize any of the sections? Like we can go through the first four maybe, like just quick. I worry like, that, I think you should, I think you should do it. I don't, I think mine would be not yeah, so Conrad, good. Go yeah, ahead. because you really, okay. you really are the person who I think has the best hold of it. Um, oh, and by the way, I was just going to say, um, I wouldn't associate this with the accelerationist position, but I would associate it with like post accelerationism in general by the way, that they sort of take Marxism and try to fit it into epistemologies derived from the philosophy of mind, rather than trying to build a theory of knowledge that is eminent to Marxism or uh, psychoanalysis slash Marxism, as the case may be, uh, a very traditional doublet. I, I forgot um, that this says witness the power. Wow. <laughs> this, this, this is a very reactionary chapter. Yeah. I got it. In terms of, uh, we're talking about moving away from the philosophy of the mind. We need to discuss. Anyway, so, the so basic, sorry, Conrad. No problem. The basic, the basic, <laughs> um, the basic point of this chapter. Again, I stress this is maybe the most important chapter in Capital. Sure. Um, the basic uh, point of this chapter is to so Marx already uh, delineates. He dispenses uh, for his own purposes with the traditional. Though he still deploys it sometimes, but he dispenses mostly for his own purposes with the traditional distinction between fixed and circulating capital. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that is capital that's retained. Uh, through uh, a single cycle of production or not, right? Fixed versus circulating. And he replaces it with the division between uh, constant capital and variable capital. Uh, and what that refers to is simply uh, capital that's dispensed in wages, right? For the purchase of labor power, which is variable capital and capital that's dispensed on everything else, which is constant capital. Though clearly certain um, things are purchased more often than others. So machinery, for example, being very, very, you know, central to this sort of uh, examination. Um, now, uh, in this chapter, uh, what Marx is essentially arguing for is the thesis that um, there's no, what he wants to, he wants to uncouple, a lot of people in, in a sort of vulgar way have supposed that as capital grows, that there's going to be greater demand for labor, right? Um, if they yeah. haven't supposed that, there's been a lot of misconceptions in any case. Um, and what Marx wants to clarify here uh, is that uh, on the contrary, we should say uh, that uh, as capital develops, uh, there is a lessened uh, proportional demand for labor. Now, it's very, very so. And then the reason for this, and I say proportional, I'll get into that. But the reason for this uh, is because um, as capital develops, uh, it's necessary uh, in order to raise productivity uh, to devote a, a greater ratio of every dollar that's invested uh, to the purchase of constant capital, right? So from machinery, yeah. for example, right? Now, because of that, right, it, it's possible for uh, the uh, mass of capital for grow to grow, but for the demand for labor to actually diminish. Yeah. Um, now, that's not necessarily the case, that the, that the absolute demand for labor will diminish, because Marx actually tr says very clearly, he's talking about proportional demand. Yeah, proportional right. demand. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it, it just makes sense that, like, in terms of, you see this tendency with Amazon in terms of they're not hiring fluff you know, what can be invested back into um, technology and machinery and um, things unrelated to labor uh, wage quality is invested into that. Um, and the workers are sort of, you know, kept at a basic minimum. I think I think um, one of the things they try to do is they, they try to have a very top, the top down approach, uh, which sort of crushes any any sort of bottom up labor organizing because they, they do have that system, which is this is going to go to this, this is going to go to this. And um, if you have a problem with that, then you can essentially leave. And it, the idea, because this sort of dominance of this uh, form of production, and you look at the sort of contemporary form of, you know, there's the prime, you could say like the prime video, there's like, it also it left accelerationism, it integrates platform capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's so funny because we talk about platform capitalism, but look at Amazon. It's a platform in various sorts of ways. It's it's shipping. It's this sort of customer service model that like it makes it really sort of easy to return stuff um, and things like that. And then ultimately, at what point do you think of a labor force? I mean, usually people think of them once they're once they're pissing in bottles and not able to take a restroom break. So then they think of a labor force. Um, but that's about it, especially now with COVID. I mean, the sort of precariat, I know precariat uh, people yeah. who are doing gig economy are, it's its competing for the same workforce, Amazon. 
Um, but that's guys, guy standing, by the way. Uh, very good um, British economist, left-wing economist, came up with the term precariat. Uh, yeah, it's a great term because it describes, you know, the precariat really describes, if, you, if you're looking, who's the proletariat? I mean, you can talk about a sort of racial, uh, you know, echoes of segregation and economic discrimination proletariat. That's valid, I'd say. But you also have to consider gig economy people or people sort of at this very lowest end of capitalism. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think to call them the precariat in terms of like a better understanding of what is this proletarian mass. And I think, I think mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's real. And you can compare the gig economy people to, you could say full-time workers and see like uh, employment conditions as well. So uh, the idea that the proletariat has disappeared is another myth of capital. No, it's, it's, uh, it's right. transformed. It's uh, technologically enabled too, yeah. because like you said, the precariat is mostly facilitated by platforms. Yeah. Right? So like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, and so on. Uh, what's your if take? I have, on it? If I have an issue with the term, it would just, like, I think it's fine. Like, I think in general, Guy Standing is like a great economist. I've seen him speak, you know, I think he has a lot to say. Um, it's a catchy term. If I have some critique with it, it would just be the fact that I wouldn't suppose that the sort of precarity or un like, I wouldn't suppose that let's say underemployment as opposed to unemployment is exclusively a phenomenon uh, of our time and place should we survey the entire history of capitalism, right? Um, sure. So I'm saying like, you know, where where hasn't there, like where has, when has there not been a precariat? Um, you know, and even if we're a bit more specific and we say like, well, underemployment, you know, more than full unemployment, let's say though certainly, you know, in, in our era now, we both are totally rampant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think, I think the underemployment thing was more of like a post, you know, 2007, 2008, whereas now I think sure. we're really in total full unemployment. Um, certainly, there would be a lot of other contexts you'd find. I think that would have been afflicted similarly, even absent something like you know the gig economy that exists now. But that's kind of nitpicking. I mean, I think it's useful, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen yeah. the same critique, and I think, like I said, it has its fundamentals. We can't just uh, pretend that the precarity is a new thing, but it does help us to to analyze the current moment, also. You know, I, one thing one thing Marx would do. And bringing mm -hmm. this back up for this relevant is in terms of what is what is the positive of this sort of precarious uh, position in this gig economy position um, in terms of an entrance from zero, you know, <laughs> in terms of just not being able to get work whatsoever. It lowers the um, it lowers the point of entry for people to get work. But the problem is, you could say there's a proportional problem here, which is when the pro when the uh, bar to entry is lower. Um, people have less of a, you could say, motive to then demand a sort of higher standard, which is generally set because people are like, mm -hmm. well, I need work and I need it now. And then they go, here you go. Um, one of the things I wrote in Zizek in the clinic is the new master is the master is the provider of convenience, right? Mm -hmm. So if labor becomes a matter of this ultra convenience, which it now is, um, then it, it becomes harder and harder to advocate for uh, fair relations within labor, of course, forces, right? Um, because people can always be kicked back to this sort of low, lowest tier of capitalism, mm -hmm. this ent entry level. Just not I, nothing. I, yeah, yeah. Can I? Yes. Can I just sum summarize the four chapters quick? Because I got through the general yeah. summary. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Or summarize the four sections <laughs> of the chapter. Sorry. So Absolutely. I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah let's. Because I just went through the very general rundown, but. The first section is called a growing demand for labor power accompanies accumulation if the composition of capital remains the same. So what Marx is saying here is essentially the title. He's saying that if you have the same composition of capital, so in other words, if the ratio of each dollar invested doesn't shift more toward constant capital as opposed to variable capital or shift at all, uh, that as uh, more and more, you know as capital is accumulated, that demand for labor will grow under those circumstances. In section two. A relative diminution of the variable part of capital occurs in the course of the further progress of accumulation and the concentration accompanying it. Marx explains how in practice, if you examine the development of capitalist economies, um, what you see tendentially uh, is that uh, there's less and less um, of each dollar invested uh, in variable capital. So what that causes is a relative diminution of the variable part of capital. And with that, a relative diminution in, in the uh, proportion of labor is needed. Now, if capital grows enough, that can still there can still be an absolute increase in the number of laborers who are needed, but there's a relative diminution, right? So for each dollar invested, um, there's less demand for labor. Uh, section three, the progressive production of a relative surplus population or industrial reserve army. Marx is basically talking about here about capitalism requires uh, for its basic functioning 
the existence of surplus population, uh, industrial reserve army, whatever you call it, um, and that uh, a huge segment of this population are consigned to obsolescence, uh, particularly in times of financial crisis. Uh, in section four, different forms of existence of the relative surplus population, the general law of capitalist accumulation, uh, Marx uh, developed some subcategories with respect to uh, surplus populations. So he talks about lumpen proletariat, for example, like prostitutes and, and so on, street musicians, whatever. Um, and uh, he also uh, states the general law of capitalist accumulation, whereby uh, the tendency uh, is for the relative diminution uh, in the variable part of capital as capitalism develops. Um, I do stress here that in a way, this part, this chapter is not complete because you can't really understand the contents of this chapter until you've read volume three uh, and the tendency, the rate of profit to fall. But one thing that is interesting is that uh, there was, I think there was one commentator who without reading uh, capital volumes two and three, he successfully deduced the tendency, the rate of profit to fall from this chapter, right? right? Just by, just by kind of reading it. Cause you can kind of see, of course, right? Cause yeah, variable, there... variable capital goes down as the relationship, as the accumulation grows up. So you lose on surplus. Well, Marx says that co that constant capital doesn't directly create value, and then he says mm -hmm. here that the tendency is for the the variable part to uh, to diminish. So right. that's how you deduce that from reading the text. Still yeah. kind of impressive, like in the time. I mean, it's a thousand pages. You would have had to have yeah. went through it pretty thoroughly and thought about it. <laughs> but, yeah, I can imagine. Um, so that, uh, uh, but that's my that's my summary. So now we can get to, to spitballing or whatever. But uh, uh, okay, yeah. Well, thank you, Conrad. <laughs> Any 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 thoughts on that? Any any anyone want to pick up where they were at? Anyone? I'm going through here. So yeah, Ernesto, okay. if you got something. Yeah, I mean, you know. I see so, Ernesto. You got the, you got the Commune magazine back there. Oh. Yeah, yeah. he's repping. He's repping Commune. Yeah, we're yeah. all uh, we're all we're all we're all very sad about the debacle that happened over there. Uh, seems like uh, you know, there was some definitely some uh dubious behavior going on, but it's very unfortunate that it had to lead to the closure of such an excellent magazine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I told well, Ernesto, to, right. I told well, Ernesto I, to save his issues. Yeah. Well, let, yeah. I think it it's might right be interesting here. to talk about um, the differences in technical capital and social capital, because mm -hmm. I think like emotional labor, um, so like in terms of like the tendency of a laborer having to um, put on airs in order to in order to function at a work and like that's like an intrinsic part of their job like the hospitality industry um yeah. effective labor as an eager and then a yeah. lot of people like to say things are emotional labor right um social capital i've never heard any critique of the vulgarization of the idea of social capital people be mm. like uh, people be like <laughs> <laughs> excuse me sorry <laughs> it's very kind I, of I, I got i got an essay back and a, a professor handed it to me once and she looked at me and she goes, you talk, you write like you speak, like it's just most disgust. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a compliment. I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing, one thing, like one thing that you have um, is in the West, right? If you're talking about this, um, you have more and more uh, the, the replacement of industrial jobs by service jobs, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, that's been, been a very, very clear pattern. Um, and you know, and, and that's like, that's, that's part of the reason that COVID right is really hurting because like it hits service jobs directly. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you have a, you have like modern capitalist economies are 78, 70 to 80%, um, based on relatively immediate forms of consumption. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's a big thing, but you had, you had like, you had the replacement of a lot of industrial, better industrial jobs by lower paying service jobs. Um, and in this context, right. You know, uh, uh, Often those were jobs that required, I mean, what Eliot's describing as emotional labor, what in feminist discourses is often described by emotional labor, um, right? The idea that, you know, it's a sort of hospitality experience or there's an interper interpersonal element that resists automation uh, mm -hmm. in any case. So Negri calls this effective labor. I think I could be blurring terms a bit, but I think he also refers to it as like feminized labor. Um, I consider these terms a little bit unscientific uh, in terms of, you know, what we're really discussing, um, but they do capture certain properties, uh, mm -hmm. I think, of what that uh, what that's entailed. Yeah, I'm trying to find something on because I'm still struggling myself with um, the what exactly is the composition of social labor from a technical standpoint, which this this 
I think technical labor is a mm -hmm. lot easier to grasp because technical labor is you, you have the means of production and you have, um, and you have labor time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of a lot easier to grasp technical, technical labor or technical production matter. Um, but, but the social, social labor, I'm still struggling with Con Conrad. Can you speak? Can you, I don't know if you have a take on it. Um, or what well, are you familiar with this the ratios and what is involved with well i about i, I i'm what i want to say here quickly is that i i guess i don't know if i'm going to respond directly but i'm going to try to um you were talking earlier about the idea of some people saying well we just need we can just like take over like the the apparatus the machinic apparatuses of commerce right in the context yeah. of the revolution and i think you know if you're going to make an argument for that um and i see this as bearing some resemblance to the accelerationist program if you're going to make an argument for that i think part of the argument uh, would have to be uh, that um, what you know. So Marx speaks sometimes in Capital in a bit of a naive way about um, about free time, right? He's like, well, then you you have labor time, you have free time, right? But you know, in actuality, what we've seen, I mean, it, like you know, Marx of course is aware in, in in a fundamental sense of the need of social reproduction. But what we've seen more and more with the development of capitalism is the way that um, even what we think of as free time is kind of subsumed, right? You know, into the cultivation of systems. Uh, that aid in the development of the general intellect or indirectly assist the valorization of capital, the furnishing of use values, right, that externally assist the reproduction of capital. Um, so I think one argument you could make, like if you were going to make the argument that, oh, you know, we're ready for a takeover, you would say, well, people have become so literate, right, in terms of how to operate, um, let's say, like digital systems that are intertwined with the valorization of capital, um, that there's a certain kind of, uh, you know, a perverse democratization. Right, that's happened as a consequence of that, um, and that that has enriched uh, the capacity for individuals, uh, you know, to engage in a way that could be applied to the creation of a new society. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that would be, and of course, like a lot of, you know, again, going back to the accelerationist thing, um, there's a lot of people who argue that, um, you know, the requirement of centrally organizing the economy would be made considerably easier today, were you to attempt to do it, um, because of breakthroughs in digitization. Um, you know, I, I certainly think, you know, China's capitalized that in, in various ways, but I mean, you can look at experiments like, um, as it project Cybersyn, I think in under Allende, right. In Chile, uh, they had mm -hmm. a big, uh, research project on how to use, right. Emergent right. computer systems to actually organize the economy. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I, I think, I think, but, but I would, I would, uh, that having been said, I would be a little bit hesitant at, um, to, I think all those things can be acknowledged, but I would be hesitant to be like, Oh, like because machines there are now. Now we can do it. Yeah, you well, know, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's totally. It, you you know, it's not. I mean, your general intuition tells you that's not true. Um, we're getting spam. Yeah, the zero okay. zero plateaus is spamming. Uh, oh, zero switched. plateaus. Yeah, you, you yeah. can you can cut it. You can cut it out if you want. Uh, um, I mean, it's good no, that's for, a, that's for right. engagement. I guess. If it keeps oh, going, no, just no, cut, yeah, cut it. Oh, yeah, it really is. Okay. Just cut it, yeah. Maybe we'll cut it. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Okay. Okay. So, um, but was... what is, I just want to take a look here. Someone said, Nick Cernicek left Accelerationist, if I'm not mistaken, shows how dependent platform capitalism is on international finance conjuncture. On the other hand, Bardbrook and Cameron in an essay, Californian Ideology, show the political ideology foundation of executives in the Silicon Valley, libertarian transhumanism, etc. How do you believe those interact since the need for profit of those mega corporations seem to be sometimes at odds with the personal ambitions of their founder money pit issues like, and I don't even know if I can see this whole comment, um, hmm. show us how dependent. So I'll, I'll go on Facebook. Yeah. But yeah, up, yeah. So he says dependent is on international finance conjuncture shows the political ideology foundation of executives. Um, I mean, we've talked a little bit here before about how, like, I think that like, if you look at, um, the animosity in the United States uh, that the tech sector has for Trump, I think a lot of it is has to do with the way that Trump has presented himself uh, as being uh, representative of of um, you know industries that are more national in terms of their interest. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, national banks. Um, you know, uh, you know, coal mining companies that don't conform to the the, the regulations of um, uh, international environmental treaties and things like that. Um, whereas I think that um, you know the uh, I think that the, uh, the Democrats in a lot of ways have become more, more representative of international capital, right? Oh, they were supposed is, to... oh, sorry. Yeah. Continue. The rest of the question is actually the rest of this, we're, we're, 
Where's the original Facebook comment? I was scrolling. Where, where is this? Where's this guy's comment on it's the? It's an anarcho. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you believe these interact? Well, this is in. Um, yeah. So the you know talking about social production. You know, uh, where is it? He says money pit issues, like trying to transfer consciousness in a computer. Sorry, the comment comes late. I had a bit of an issue well, to properly frame it. Yeah, well, the, the social production becomes in the hand of the capitalists alone, right? Um, so the California ideology, which is the idea of, you could say, socially progressive, you know, which means do whatever. So, you know, smoke your pot, marry, marry the same sex, while having a libertarian ideology. And... One of the one of the problems with the libertarian ideology versus the anarchist ideology, um, you know, they'll off, oftentimes will be compared, and then anarchists will also be talked to, um, you could say, by socialists as sort of like pseudo fascist in their sort of yeah. appearance, but it's, it's not quite so simple, um, because the anarchist position, which is this freedom of something which is disjoint, so say you have an oppressive state, capitalist, let's just say. You could say state, but I'll sure. say capitalist state to not bother anybody. <laughs> Let's say oppressive. Cap but it's also, you know, every state you can do this. Um, so you have a smaller form which needs to represent, and they have a, you could say, a union. A union is kind of an anarchist formation, which then uh, you can, it advocates for its interests. It can insurrect and just sort of destroy apparatuses of the state, um, all sorts of stuff. Versus, so it's like, and then libertarians will be like, well, I'm an anarchist. It's like, you're not because you don't believe in this. What you believe in is sort of the gut, the big government or whatever, letting, uh, letting capitalists sort of do whatever. And you have the non-aggression principle, which says not only can capitalists do whatever, and non-aggression is like, oh, I like non-aggression. I like when people don't fight. Well, that what that means is you don't, you don't hit Jeff Bezos. Well, no one's hitting Jeff Bezos, first of all. Means it's like you don't you don't uh, you don't break anything at the Amazon warehouse. So it's basically how it functions is just a very anti-revolutionary idea. It's what the state already does. The state already does that, right? Um, so there's nothing radical in the libertarian and Ayn Rand, who's basically like, oh, we should all mutually things. You always always side on the side of the civil the civilized. Is Ayn Rand's mm -hmm. little uh, jab at everything. Um, <laughs> so but that's so it's intrinsic which is the idiot it might seem like libertarian ideology is like oh it's they believe in they're sort of have this buddhist idea there's even something like dark buddhism which is like buddhism and ayn rand and it at people are like that's so stupid it has nothing to do with each other but it's like it um it, it kind of does because if you want if you have to ignore the product you know the discontent forces mm -hmm. uh, you paint it over with this sort of philosophy of the mind um, Reason Mag, you know, Ayn Rand Libertarian Magazine is called Reason Magazine. Um, it's called Reason Magazine because it sort of posits this this being, this vitalist being, which where people don't physically fight each other, and capitalists are kind of free to do whatever uh, they want. Um, and there's, and you know, when when differentiating between libertarianism and ar anarchy. Um, and anarchy is not fascism. I mean, there's a similarity in terms of you have a group, they're unionized kind of incoherently um, so a lot of times, um, and they exact force with no laws to prevent them to not exact that force. Um, it's not really, so when the state does that, it's very, very, very bad. Um, mm -hmm. When the state does that, it means lots of people get killed. It means all the most reactionary ideas get you know, weaponized, um, dissent is crushed. Uh, so when the state does that, but when you say like, you know, a group of workers does that, it's simply a different thing. Quantity has a quality, Hegel 101, Hegel's logic, which, or Trotsky as well. Um, so, yeah, just something something to keep in mind. I think it's it's important, like this might seem basic to some of you, um, but it's, it's, it's really important, I would say, to address these kinds of mm -hmm. uh, Hegelian unities that the right likes to do. You could say the right is a little too Hegelian here. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of, I'm just kind of like messing around. But really it's like violence and violence same. No, mm -hmm. state violence. Yeah. If quantity, I understand, yeah. if I understand yeah. Elliot, Elliot correctly, part of what he's saying is that, um, you know, for all the, the talk of, um, you know, kind of 
you know, if you have like Google, right, that everyone's reading like doulas, like the like, you know, rhizomes and things like that. Ultimately, their individual individuality um, necessarily has to be in agreement with the, you know, the legal individuality that's imposed by the state, um, because that's what, you know, the protection of their investments, for example, is predicated upon. Um, I mean, I think, I, and I want to add to that, that I think that um, if you look at the tension between, um, you know, different kinds of firms in the United States, I think one is that um, there are firms in the United States uh, that are frustrated, let's say, uh, with internationalization, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, when you have these cheap pools of labor that are introduced, right, um, it's effectively impossible for them to, uh, you know, without capital controls, it's effectively impossible for them to remain competitive while paying the wages that are required to employ people in the United States, yeah. right? So that's that's part of the way that you can, you, can, you know, um, build a, a, a column of support from business, right, for more protectionist measures. Um, but I think if you look at Silicon Valley, like the tendency is very, very different in the sense that I think that um, Silicon Valley is really thinking globally, right, in terms of, you know, um, this is transient, transient sort of work. We want to be able to exploit labor forces anywhere, you know, with the lowest rates possible uh, and to conduct business on a, on, a, on a completely international context. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny um, about the, no the Nazbol contingent. When, and I and I did say about which is which I think is is would it's if only leftists would even consider this which they don't because I would say I would say social racial tensions are too high to even consider something like this but Trump's um emit, like his high tariffs on things which are outside or things which are from uh, you could say the global global south or whatever mm -hmm. um, where you know if you did have extremely high taxes on all these imports it would there would be um, a motive to make things in the U.S. and to raise quality of labor to a certain extent. Um, right. Yeah, but th but the production of those things is funded by the U.S., so they will, of course, they wouldn't do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the 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 problem with like like from part of the problem with Trump's economic policy is it doesn't really make sense. I mean, I was well, reading an article. Do that. It's it's about yeah. him bullying specific countries. So yeah. yeah. So it doesn't really work. Right. If it, well, but I was saying, if it was you universal, can't, yeah, um, you can't do that. You can't do that because labor, right? you can't. Well, what, fully carry you with can't that. do that. Okay. Why can't, you can't I? Do pull, that? You, well, you can't fully carry with that program. At, you know, and I think part of the reason for this. China uh, now is, Nosbol. No, China isn't Nosbol. I was saying Nosbol because there was, I, I, I received an offer from. You, did, by the way, there's a gigantic right wing Reddit conspiracy, and all the, all the, all the top alt right authors or people, they all talk to each other. That's all I'll say about that. So one of those guys wanted to start a press and then basically was like, I want you to help build this press. But it's like, no, because ultimately these these guys fall on the side of the right and every everything gets, there's a union of the right in terms of one party right wing. Like I said, you, you, you know, when you're talking about one party leftism and one party right wingism, um, Nazbol is not, China is not Nazbol again. Um, China's one-party leftism, uh, which is definitely very, 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 very different than Nazbo, which is a sort of quirky part of the right, but it's always been part of the right. It's always been, even in Nazi Germany, historically, um, national Bolshevikism was a kind of like quirky thing that, you know, some fucking assholes would try to get some of the Hitler youth to join yeah, as sure. well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so it was, it's always been of the right. So no, Always China. So there's your nuance. You said, well, China, now Nazbol. When are we gonna hear nuance? No, China is not Nazbol. China is certainly um, not Nazbol. Yeah. I just want to finish just to get just to get to that point though. Yeah, the yeah. reason that, that Trump can't carry out um, this actual program is because like if you look at um, if you look at the diminution in the rate of profit that's characteristic of um, the United States, right, as a uh, you know an area that's very very an economy that's very developed, very automated to compensate for that. Uh, it's necessary to uh, extract rents from elsewhere, right? Um, so, you know, you have to have foreign investments, right? In other words, mm -hmm. like American companies going and exploiting foreign labor in order to make, up, make up for that, which is why uh, effectively uh, Trump Trump's whole economic policy becomes like a have your cake and eat it too, yeah. right? Um, because what it's based on is like, we have the right to extract rents from foreign countries, right? Um, but at the same time, we want to safeguard, right? Um, you know, so, uh, more of our domestic industries, Right, um, yeah. you know, from uh, a genuine international competition, um, and you know, I guess you know, it's it, like you could say in a way, like he'll, he'll say, well, in Japan they do this, like we sign a free trade agreement, and you know, but they don't sell American cars there, right? 
um, you know, they find ways like locally, for example, of, of, of rooting that off. But at the same time, it's like if you look at the history of the development of the Japanese economy, America traditionally supported that, right? Um, because mm -hmm. they were trying to build like a, a counterpower to China, like Chinese communism, right? And there, there weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of capitalist economies to trade with. Now that is changing now, right? The relations between between China and Japan are always a bit prickly. You know, that's that's, that's an issue. I just mean well now the, now it's getting yeah. worse, of course. Um, China or Japan's actively trying to take everything out of China that they can. Yeah. Well, did you hear about the did you hear about the um, the the embassies that were or the trade consulates that were closed? I guess America, oh, right. yeah, America ordered that um, uh, China close its its trade consulate in Houston uh, and they called it uh, uh, ground zero for like a, a spying and intellectual property theft. Uh, and then China announced that America had like four days to get their trade consulate out of Chengdu. Um, so you can see that, that uh, that's kind of heating up, right? Um, but, I, but my point is just to say that, um, you know, Trump's support for perfect, per protectionism is always quite uh, is always going to be quite equivocal because of that mm -hmm. dependency. And in fact, like on a purely from a purely economic standpoint, you could argue that, a, like, I think a much more coherent strategy would be to encourage international trade, but just to redistribute wealth enough domestically that you weren't facing like the kind of civil problems that you have now. I mean, I think that would yeah. that would be like the current strategy. And that's closer to what, you know, it's not there are issues, but this is closer to what I think the consensus is in the Democratic Party. Right. That we should be, you know, um, that we should be embracing free trade. And then if there are jobs, like, I think I read that that 2% of the American, 2% um, of American laborers lost their jobs because of the exportation of production to China. So it's like, it's not that big, right? But I, I just think- 2% of have, American labor, that's, that's, that's a decent amount of people. It's a lot, but what I mean is that it's not like, it's not the end of days, right? I'm saying there's ways to make up for that, right? Yeah. You know, in terms of, you know, um, and what I mean is that, like, you know, when Trump blames, you know, China or Mexico or whatever, right? I mean, what's obviously elided by this kind of commentary mm -hmm. is the fact that, you know, America hasn't done enough domestically, right? Um, you know, to actually, uh, you know, use uh, fiscal policy to offset the damages of this, right? right. Um, so again, yeah. again, in a way, th this is Trump's like weird um, backward solution to the problem of wealth inequality, right? Well, it's Just a non-solution. Like, it's a superficial solution. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, the chapter talks about this. this uh, maybe I'm using, maybe you can correct me on this, Conrad. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The superficiality of political economy shows itself in the fact that it looks upon the expansion and, oh, this is, this is towards credit specifically. Um, so Marx, Marx talks about, uh, he, he doesn't expand on it, but he talks about credit becoming, we didn't talk about credit. I think maybe that would be another thing we can talk about, even though he doesn't really talk too much about it. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, very important. It, yeah, yeah uh, the fact that this sort of credit system exists and then becomes another sort of force of capital. And you can even say, why, you know, why is, why are student loans, such, why is free college such a big issue? Um, it's not just, it's not just, oh, you wanna go to college and you want me to pay for it, right? Um, you know, to get your underwater basket weaving degree. Uh, there's something more uh, than let's the nuance. He says, I just he says he doesn't like China. He doesn't like Nazlo. Where when are we going to hear the nuance? So here's here's your nuance. Sure. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, abolishing abolishing loans taken out by people who went to college has a Kantian issue, you could say, where it's not exactly universally, you could say, idealistically fair to people who already paid off their loans or whatever. But it would be, it would be a revolutionary sort of act against credit itself, because, you know, a lot of, to get higher tiered jobs in the U.S., you need to enter into college. Mm -hmm. and when you enter into college, and you want to, you know, you want to expand it. You go and say you're like, oh, maybe I'll get a master's degree or a PhD. Uh, you are in the credit system. Um, in the credit system, that credit itself is how um, capitalism reproduces itself. Of course. Uh, so it's not simply a matter of individual fairness, but a, a matter of forcing people into the system of credit, which reproduces. Capital, well, we can we right? can we can be say we can say quite schematically that like that 
you know, um, when the United States took the pedal off the gas, right, in terms of, you know, redistributing the gains of increased productivity, that, like, so, you know, certainly with the neoliberal shift, Reagan Thatcher, and so on, mm -hmm. um, that there was an increased significance that was assigned to credit. So it's like, it's got the cult of the credit card, right, really, really takes off around that time, around 1980, right, this idea of having like multiple credit cards. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, consumer credit becomes a big thing, again, because people don't have, don't have the money to live, right? So you're getting cheaper goods than are manufactured in China, replacement of industrial jobs by service jobs and credit. And all of that is what is sort of allowing people in some cases to squeak by, right? Sure. Um, and this is part of the reason that um, uh, COVID was such a big thing, right? Was because if you look at the conditions of the US economy, um, prior to when COVID hit, like you had really big debt levels. The corporate debt levels were like at an all time high, uh, you know, obviously state debt, very, very high. Uh, low productivity growth and so on. And this is one of the misconceptions about coronavirus, right? There was a recession coming in the United States. It was inevitable. The whole economy was overheated, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, you know, like that was just the trigger and it, and it worsened it considerably compared to what it might have been, right? Um, but this was something inevitable that was going to happen. Now, I, I, Michael Roberts, the economist, he says he said that when we look at when bourgeois economists in the future talk about what happened here, I'm sure they're going to say, oh, coronavirus came along and that's what caused that. Sure. Right. But, you know, on every level, right, we're talking about the causes of it. I and mean, we could talk about, you know, China, where you have uh, this really callously cobbled together wild animal trade that emerged because of the displacement uh, by, of peasant agriculture. Right. Uh, the precarity of the U.S. economy because of automation and lack of redistribution, um, you know, but also in the whole structure of the economy I mean, years of cuts to Medicare. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, big pharma companies who weren't focusing on research for infectious diseases that typically affect poor countries. Of course, um, you know, all down the line. Right. Uh, you know, again, the whole focus on fast paced consumerism, right, rather than the investment of capital at a, at a large scale or national level. Um, you know, all of these things conspired. You know, so, again, I actually just finished an article for Culture Rico. But my basic thesis is that, like, you know, coronavirus, you know, is above all uh, a crisis of infrastructure and economy. Yeah. Right. And I don't think it's correct just to attribute it uh, to being a, a, a natural kind of thing. Um, I just want to say here. Uh, Nestor says this actually reminds me of Richard Wolf always says that what the U.S. ought to do is just lean to its comparative advantages, industrially speaking, rather than do productionism, protectionism. Yeah, I agree. I would add as a supplement that I think you're going to have to redistribute wealth more as well if you're going to do that. Yeah. So I think it's a two pronged strategy, um, which is interesting because Marxism as economic philosophy is always seen as this absolutely heterodox way of looking at things. When you read his economic writings, it's very clear that a lot of it is done through the lens of classical economics and the style of Smith and Ricardo from which Marx, of course, kind of inherited his labor theory of value. Uh, emphasis very much on kind of. Yeah, it's true. But but um, but keep in mind uh, that the ultimate message of capital is the unreformability of capital. Of course. Right. That's the ultimate message of it. So, you know, that now now capital can be productive in terms of thinking about how capitalism could be reformed in the short run. Um, I think someone up here made a comment about UBI, right? Yeah. Um, Maybe, Maybe you could use UBI as a stopgap measure. Maybe we can talk about that for a minute. Uh, do you guys have any any thoughts on UBI here? Yeah, UBI, I'm always hesitant about. I think what would be better than UBI, a lot better than UBI, um, would be maybe um, you could have like a universal basic housing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah why, is that either, uh, why is that either or though? Like that's like. Um, why is it either or? Because UBI, it is either or. To a certain extent, because not that, not that the, I'm saying universal basic housing. This, you know, it, any any idiosyncratic policy proposal is realistically not going to, you know, you really should engage with what is out there to a certain extent. But in terms of just as sort of why UBI kind of fails a little bit, um, I, th I think a lot a lot of a lot of price issues come into play with with UBI. You know, I, I don't think it's a terrible idea uh, exactly, but I but I, I worry about the effects of um, giving a sort of social security income to everybody. I mean, um, honestly, I think one of the bigger problems- doesn't need it. I don't, you know, if you don't need UBI- um, I'm against the, I'm, I'm, I'm against why, the- why, why, should I, why should I get UBI? I'm against the inflation- I'm, I'm, I'm against the inflation argument about UBI. I don't think it would lead to uh, don't think would, I don't think inflation would be a problem. But well, more money say, in production means there's too much. You know, Marx himself writes in this chapter. Uh, I know something in this chapter. Woo! I'm referencing the chapter. Good for me. <laughs> um, but, you know, if too, there is such a thing as too much money in circulation. Mm. There's um, such a thing. Yeah, but, but like like you have to look at like the actual tangible cost that are just because of UBI. 
right? So UBI, like, usually, like, I would say it usually rests on like, a three-point argument, right? Yeah. Um, and one is that it, uh, one is that it increases demand for goods, right? Two is that it reduces social costs, right? So they did a study in yeah. Canada in Dauphin, Manitoba, and they found, like, within two years of giving UBI, uh, high school dropouts down 12%, general hospital visits down 14%. Um, mm -hmm. And the third is that it actually encourages automation, right? Because people are currently kind of priced into, into jobs, like, where it's cheaper than to automate. Right. You know, uh, if they have less motivation to take those jobs, it's actually going to encourage automation. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is you have to look at, um, you know, uh, you have to look at at how productivity is going to be affected. Right. In terms of the implementation of UBI and how the delegation of social costs is going to be affected. I also think that, um, you know, like we're, you know, OK, so I'm not saying it may, may not have certain inflationary effects on very obvious things like housing. But, you know, like I, th I think I don't think that that's. Uh, an insurmountable obstacle. And also for mm -hmm. things like that, you have, uh, you know, you have laws, rent controls and things which are very common um, yeah. that can be used to address it. So, so I don't think that, and, and so most maybe studies right, haven't Conrad, indicated that's a huge problem. Maybe you're right, Conrad. I think it speaks to the fact that UBI is a real measure out there and UBH doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, there is, there is an idea that people should always be able to have housing. So I think, um, yeah, I think in actuality, the UBI problem is is worked out to a certain degree, and it is a sort of uh, leftist demand. Although I know for a fact, I've seen you know the the consequences of income while people are working is it does create an incentive to go back to this sort of classical economic dynamics and to, to not not um to not work to not. But 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 here's the point is that it actually it actually enables like it would actually like a, a lot of the sectors where people are receiving the lowest wages are actually automatable sectors. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm saying mm -hmm. you can actually enable the, the rendering of the economy more efficient. Right. Um, yeah. Well, you know, for and, instance, and, unemployment that's currently happening with, with the COVID-19 and then the right wing argument is essentially um, well, it motivates people to not work. And I, I think the, the response is, yeah, is like, of course. Um, mm -hmm. To try to to try to get around that um, is just, and I know you know I have friends personally who they work as waiters and then their unemployment check was higher than their waiter job. What are mm -hmm. you going to do? You can just not be a waiter. Um, well, yeah, but like what what I'm saying though is it can inaugurate like a transition within the economy yeah, that can actually but, yeah. increase productivity, which which would offset uh, inflation. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I think there I think the argument is not but I think the nuance comes in. It's not is not you don't make the final right wing turn. Right. Mm -hmm. Um which is like ergo, this is all in terms of you sort of recognize that UBI is sort of this so social democratic idea that sort of thinks about uh the reforming of capitalism. And as you said previously. You know, the point of capital is that capital is not uh, reformable. Mm -hmm. or, a certain, or, a or, or a libertarian idea. Yeah. Um, you know, it speaks that Andrew Yang says he's a capitalist and he popularized UBI in the mainstream conversation. Yeah, I was also going to uh, say something to that effect. But Here that doesn't you... mean it's a terrible idea. It's just, you know, I, I would say UBI has flaws, but insofar as it's part of the leftist program, I don't think it's worth being explicitly this. So this is the left wing thing. I don't think it's worth being explicitly against UBI um, as such or programs which try it in cities. Because I think I haven't heard cases of cities implementing UBI and then the city just going to shit. Um, sure. <laughs> so let's look at like material, yeah. right? So I so I wonder. I wonder. Um, I think UBI has its flaws and it has its sort of economic possibilities. But the problem is that. The amount of money given to people in a UBI versus, um, you could say, are given to the forces of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the, the the problem is there. You know, uh, with the critiques of UBI, which are kind of obvious interpersonal critiques, um, is that they don't they don't necessarily affect the economy uh, as like the ultimate sort of evil in the way that. Um, keep, you know, the right wing is bringing up, they go interpersonal critique, ergo, everything goes to shit. I don't think that's necessarily true. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it will incentivize people not to work or get an extra check or whatever. Um, I, but I don't think it will necessarily lead to a crash. Right. right. Well, here's the, here's the, so someone says, what, what effect would you be on the rates of pro rate of profits on the whole? Okay. So like, this is really hard also because even calculating rates of profit is hard. 
but I'll give you like a kind of, here's like the basic argument, like from a, from a reproduction of capitalism standpoint, here's the basic argument of UBI. Um, here's like to be very, very schematic where it would help is in, because right now there's a real problem that capitalism has in terms of um, realizing value for the good, the, object, the, the goods which are created. Right. So that's where it would help. Right. Is in terms of stimulating consumption. Right. Now here's mm -hmm. where it would hurt. Where it would hurt is in the huge tax burden. Right. Um, that the huge cost that would have to be assumed, right, by corporations, by uh, wealthier parties and so on, right, in order mm -hmm. to finance that, right? So the question is weighing those two things, right? right. Um, you know, it, and this is, this is so Yang's sort of argument is like, well, the, the, you know, and this is really his argument. His argument is the, the valorization, like the crisis of valorization, of realizing value is becoming so acute. So he gives examples of like, well, soon we're headed to self-automating, self-driving cars. The, the most common job in the United States is to be, uh, a truck driver. It's not hard for one of those guys to go park his, you know, and you, and Yang really approaches it from the bourgeois standpoint, right? It's yeah. not hard for one of those guys to park his truck, you know, on a highway and block off all the, all the traffic coming in, right? When that happens. So uh, Yang's argument is that the civil crisis and the economic crisis that is going to emerge because of pervasive automation, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and it seems to have, have uh, beaten him to the, to the punch with COVID, but the crisis that's going to occur um is so vast that it justifies the assumption of the cost right and, well, and also think... he, he also he argues that the cost is deceptive yeah. because when you look into like when you look at how much of it is like relatively quickly recycled back into the economy because it's being can i drop people, can i drop and... a term can i make up a term sure. right now what's underestimated in that people will automate automate everything away let's 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 come up with this nice term the john the john connor variable right um no matter how automated things get no matter how smart AI gets, there will be a human push, push essentially, um, especially if humans are in control of it, right? So the idea that the economy will crash because everything gets uh, automated away, I would say doesn't take into account the John Connor variable, which, you know, if you don't know John Connor from the Terminator movies, you know, he, he's, yeah. he, um, <laughs> you, you all should know Conrad's, Conrad's, I can't. Sorry, I project a lot onto Conrad. I know I am. I'm actually. I'm actually. Because he's the though. subject I'm, supposed I'm, to know. One of the only. One of the only. One, this is one of the only times I'm actually annoyed. So, so people say things like you that. And I do. I do like. Yeah, I am. This is one of my rare times. People say stuff like this, and I know. You know, like oh, people will always books will always survive because people love print or whatever. Um, sure. You know, I mean, I think that the reality here is that uh, if you look at like I'm not saying that what you're saying. Yeah. Is necessarily incorrect but if you look at the history of of, of why that's happened which is very important why yeah. has that happened right that's usually happened i would argue because of systemic intervention by states uh to sure. actually rescue their their societies from essentially revolutionary conditions right um you know or because of you know re like recognizing and permitting yeah. the realization of the demands of organized labor right because otherwise there's going to be again the sort of acute crisis with respect to the realization of value that yang is talking about Right. So, the, so again, I feel like the, the thing would be if you're talking about the John Connor variable, the John Connor yeah, variable nice. is Yang. He, that is Yang <laughs> supporting the UBI, for example, yeah. right? Among other things. Yeah. Um, so I'm saying you can't, like, it doesn't really suffice as like a theory of like, oh, well, that's going to work itself out. Sure. Right. Because like the point is that there has to be actual actors that are intervening to, mm -hmm. to creating that situation. So that would be my, um, I just want to go to Ender Wigan here. He says, well, if you have companies that don't pay taxes, how are you going to fund UBI? Eventually the state will run out of money. Admittedly, it's true that, um, that uh, you know, obviously like fiscal dumping and, you know, competition with respect to international tax rates has made it much harder um, to increase tax on corporations. That having been said, I mean, I've looked at the numbers that Yang has put forth for UBI, and I don't think it's impossible for the United States to do that um, along the lines of what he's describing. Um, right. I also think that you have to remember that the United States is a really, really good business climate, right? So there's a lot of demand to be in that market, right? So that means that people will be a lot more likely probably to shoulder the taxes associated with that than they would be, you know, to do so in a market uh, that wasn't nearly as significant, right? When it comes to, you know, the circulation of commodities, uh, for example, or production or other things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's very, very important uh, to keep in mind. Any, any thoughts on that? I was going to go to this. When I brought up UBI, I was using it the same way that Yang used it, in the sense that assuming total automation, then UBI is the only thing that saves the current system from total collapse. I, I don't uh, think, I see, that's what I'm saying is, yeah, I think Conrad's thesis, and I mean, Conrad should be annoyed at me here, because Conrad's whole thesis is to take out philosophy of the mind 
uh, and you can say similar to Nick Land's project, which is uh, in terms of yes, uh, you know, Conrad, to, to further piss off Conrad. <laughs> um, in terms of to to no, that's that's say fair. That, to say that just, uh, to know, take out the, the mind human, altogether and not philosophy. Of mind. Yeah, yeah. To say to eliminate the human in terms of what does humanism represent? Humanism represents these sorts of variables that are false variables, right? I think they can represent these sort of vague right wing. You know, it's such a bad term. The human is such a such a term co-opted by, you know, capitalists trying to, or, you know, you could say heretical, heretical, <laughs> exactly, a hereditary monarchy like in South America. Um, or I don't fucking, <laughs> I'm so stupid. <laughs> anyway, in South, in like South America or Latin American countries, uh, that, you know, the, t the tendency of these former dictators, families to then, now, there, I, where, weren't we talking about this? You were talking, someone was talking, we were talking about this in the other episode. Yeah, what uh, is it, um, the woman? Uh, oh, yeah, the uh, woman, the woman who's now the human, human rights to, y Yanessa, activist, what is right? it? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember the name, Ernesto? Who? The, the, the woman who was in, the, in Bolivian, the Bolivian, uh, Jenny uh, Alvarez? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so so the so that's sort of the face of the human, which is these sorts of totally superficial yeah, obscuring I mean, I of I'm yeah of the obscuring of the actual processes which are happening. So then there's a I think you see that happen so much. Um, it's that I think it's it's easy to it's and it's so referenced and taken out of context. But I think mm -hmm. the reason is is because there is a process which is real in terms of. Ultimately, it's going to serve the capitalists to a certain extent who create, once again, they create, you know, the industrial uh, reserve army in order to make capitalism function, right? Um, so these are, these are not, um, this is not a purely automated system. So even if you can fully automate the workers, ultimately you want to create more wagers uh, in order to uh, maintain capitalism. So I think we, we are in agreement that, um, that, this this sort of uh, this sort of thing serves capitalism, but I don't think full automation will happen. And it's sort of maybe even a further push for a fully automated luxury communism or whatever. Although I, I, I simply don't see that happening um, because ultimately you want a laborer that is that gets the full value of its, their labor to a certain extent. Um, so. So, yeah, there's lots of there's lots of reasons why full automation won't happen. I think. Well, you, uh, so which, the real which are the various. Yeah, go on. So, so the real uh, the the real issue I think is that like so someone says here like uh, UBI would limit our ability to reach a, a communist society because capitalists would be entrenched on the surface of things, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that because I think that um, like. Profit rates uh, would, like, if you had an increase in productivity associated with elevated automation, right, um, in the in the context of UBI, profit rates would continue to decline, right, um, which means eventually, uh, I assume there would be some effort to rescue the system by trying to abolish uh, these kind of these kind of benefits. I'm speculating here. Um, I guess what I'm, you know, and that itself could trigger a class struggle on a different terrain. I mean, for example, it was commonly assumed after like one, you know, thing a lot of policymakers thought was that after World War II, when, you know, in the United States, you had salaries growing in an approximate um, manner with raises and pro rises in productivity. A lot of people thought, well, there'll be no more re revolutionary tension anymore. Right. But that's not actually what happened. Right. Um, so right. I would be a little bit I would be a little bit careful about making these kind of projections about that. I'm saying that I think one thing that UBI could do is actually encourage automation, right? Yeah. Um, in other words, like, you know, which could lead to an increase in the mass of surplus value, but diminish the rate of profit further. Um, and that I think it could it could set the stage for subsequent forms of class struggle that would take place on that transformed terrain, right? Mm -hmm. Wait, um, and, I, and, I, got you know, hot, I got the hottest take, wait, Connor. Was... <laughs> UBI won't happen, uh, full automation won't happen because of emotional labor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, in a sense, in terms of there are parts which resist automation, sure. right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, you know, always, always, yeah, yeah. No, no, like, I agree with those that. Those things like, require emotional yeah. labor, formally defined yeah. emotional labor. Sure, they, yeah. Mm. There will always be nuance. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but okay, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I assume I assume when anyone talks about, when anyone talks about full automation, they mean in a relative sense, right? Because sure. like, it's impossible to imagine the liquidation of, of literally every person in the labor yeah, force, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, someone writes yeah. Justin Murphy couldn't be He's with us be today. He's gonna be here. He'll uh, be here no. in two weeks. Yeah. Uh, we're, so next week we yeah, will not so. be here. Conrad, Conrad needs a break from. <laughs> He just gives his shoulders a break from fucking carrying it. Um, so yeah. we're going. We're going. Yeah, to we're going to be. We're going to be week. carried by the the Ubermensch, uh, Delizian, singular rhizomatic genius, uh, based I, I am, God, I, I, uh, Justin yeah. Murphy. <laughs> so, so next two weeks, Justin Murphy will be on this program. Uh -huh. um, Nestor is here. Yeah, that'll be the, that's, that'll be really good for all the people here who are unhappy that that were. Uh, we're not incoherent enough. Uh, you'll be very glad to know that we're going to have Justin Murphy on here. Uh, oh, I see Nestor has been on there, and I haven't let him on the stream. Yeah. No, let, he okay. just got here like a second ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just got here like literally a minute ago. Yeah. yeah. I, was, Hi, Nestor. I mean, it would, I thought about this like maybe 10 minutes ago when you were talking about like, you know, universal housing and universal basic income and all that. Uh, and like the unreformability of capital, I guess. And it actually reminded me um i mean it's, this is not like really like a marxist point i guess uh but like john rawls in his theory of justice right sure. uh, when he says like well there's only two possible kind of arra institutional arrangements that fulfill my two principles of justice which is like um liberal socialism and property owning democracy right and actually, like he explicitly said, he explicitly says that like welfare capitalism does not fulfill his principles of justice, right? Even though like a lot of people take Rawls to be like this kind of just like defender of the like Western welfare state kind of thing, but he explicitly says like no, 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 this is not what I'm talking about, right? But the interesting thing about I find about like property owning democracy in particular is that it's basically universal basic capital in a way. Because, mm -hmm. um, like, I mean, it's the name property owning democracy just sounds like it's a democracy where, like, people are free to own capital. But it's actually kind of like a democratization of the ownership of capital. It's just, like, not necessarily collectively owned by, oh, yeah. like, workers' councils or whatever, right? It's just, like, right, right, the state will, like... Right tax capital and like mm -hmm. give it to people so that like everyone is like a capital owner like each person is like their own kind of small business so you know it's like i think it goes in the same vein and that um you know maybe we can consider ubi or ubh or we can i guess consider like ubc in a way like universal basic capital is like yeah. another you know you know what Na yeah, but, but yeah, what's the difference? like if you if you yeah. have if you have wealth if you have wealth you can translate it to capital right so it's like that right. you know i mean like i i don't see the explicit disconnect i mean it depends how you structure ubi like if ubi is just something that is there to meet like the absolute bare minimum need well then you know like it really depends on the level in terms of whether it could be whether it could be saved whether it's something that you can collect in addition to working a job i mean it, it's really contingent on all those variables it seems Perfect. to me that the way of creating UBI that functions more as a universal basic form of capital is just to give one that can be uh, uh, piled with other things, mm -hmm. right? Um, in such a way right. that it would actually allow for the accumulation of capital by individuals rather than just meeting basic needs. But I do think meeting basic needs is also very important. Yeah. No, of course. But like the thing is, if if you have, if you're able to accumulate right. capital, then. Um, it's because you already met your basic needs, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was saying. It depends how you structure a UBI. That that would be. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel personally flexed on by Ender's analysis here. <laughs> <laughs> this 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 describes me to a T. Yeah. Like we, we really have to we really have but, to differentiate. Oh, sorry. Continue. Yeah. So in terms of Robin Hood capitalism, uh, he's a rebel because he worked within the structure uh, versus versus sort of a structural. Change. I think my you could almost say my entire um, book effort is Robin Hood esque in terms of you know towards it towards yeah. a Robin towards a Robin Hood therapy uh, position you could say. 
Uh, yeah. Well, I also want to say, I also want to speak to Nestor specifically because okay. I love what Nestor's doing um, in his Camu group in terms of the, the problem of electoralism. Yeah. You really, it, there is a party called the Deep State Labor Party. Um, so Nestor, if you don't know, runs Philosophy Anti Marginalization Union with Vlad and Azim. You, and you, you, Sam. Run insane, you run that insane group. <laughs> You didn't know that? Yeah, yeah, over there. it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah he's, he's one of the four, and I think, I haven't seen um, the the couple of right-wing. Sh shout out to Robert long. Brown, by the way, Islamic communism. You guys got so many great <laughs> ideas over there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, that's, that's that nice like, but, but in terms of, like, there are the four of them, which are the real deep state, which actually run things, right? And then you've set up the election. Right. So there, there's oh, the yeah. deep state labor party, which is ironically <laughs> the signifier of the deep state. But Nestor is in fact Nestor, Vlad, mm -hmm. Sam, yeah. Azim, and I, I suppose I'm per I'm like accidentally forgetting, even though I've met him in real life. The right. Oh, uh, Jason. Yeah, Jason. <laughs> yeah. That is slip. Depression. <laughs> uh but yeah, oh, oh, someone asked here, Samuel Cuppers asked, missed the part about universal basic dividend. Did you say yay or nay? Uh, I mean, I said, I said yes, but I don't think it's a long-term solution to the, the, the structural crisis of capital. But I also said that I think I, I, I want to get beyond the aporia of just saying like, if we do this, it's going to weaken the prospect of revolution. Because I, I was talking about how like after World War II, people assumed that, that you know, um, a correspondence, a rough correspondence between productivity and wages would uh, weaken the zeal for revolution. But uh, there was still a lot of opposition that flourished in that context. Um, you know, on the train, maybe more I said of relations of production and things like that. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I, I don't I, I don't think it's always good to side with that kind of reductive analysis. I think there can be a class struggle that takes tr place in another train precisely because, you know, a UBI is not going to fix everything. Right. There are there are issues because it, to say UBI fixes is going to fix everything is to use a social democratic critique where you're only looking at like supply and demand. It's a Keynesian critique. But if you're actually yeah. looking at, at, right. at profit. Right. Then then that's not going to fix mm. that problem. So there's still going to be struggles. Mm -hmm. Yield, yield graph. <laughs> yield, yield Keynes graph. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't like. I don't like the left. graph, which is a nice slip there. I don't like the left. Like, and you graph it onto everything, and it's like must supply and demand. I don't it's like, like the well, left. What about these processes? My two <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't like the left anti-UBI argument because I feel like it it capitulates to certain common notions with respect to, you know, everyone needs the dignity of a good job. It's like the, the idea here is to actually reinvent, you know, mm -hmm. what what labor means, right? What productivity means, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, which is already axiomatically governed in a lot of respects, but to, but to participate in that shift. Um, you know, I, I don't like, you know, people like a lot of the arguments aren't good. People will say, like, I don't buy the inflation thing. No offense, Elliot. I don't. I sometimes people will say, you, "Oh, you, every, you don't buy that UBI will cause inflation." I, you know, I don't I think, think it, UBI I don't think is worth fighting for. I don't think it's for, a serious uh, obstacle. Because I am a can, can can we just can I be a permanent bad guy? Because this describes my how, what my how my brain works normally. Also, <laughs> it works because Conrad is more learned than me, so he can always dab on me. I'm a Robin Hood capitalist. Not about psychoanalysis. Democratic socialist. Not about psychoanalysis. In terms of that, like I'm always thinking of. Um, you could say democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. uh, ways to sort of subvert, mm -hmm. right? We had a, a, a UBI proposition here in Mexico. I don't know if you heard about that, Nestor. Oh yeah, but it's like quite old, right? No, no, it was recent uh, oh. for the pandemic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I was thinking about like, doing UBI now, yeah. You know, like the pre did it like, uh, I forgot the name of this Senator, but like maybe like 2009 or something. Sure, yeah, 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 I remember that too. No, but also th this is for Elliot, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm. What is? Wait. Okay. Oh, it's no. I, I I was trying to share my screen, but it's not oh, working. Uh, yield graph. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, you have admin control? How do you have admin control? How does it? No, no like, everyone no. can share their screen. Oh, everyone can do that. No, I did it. He, had, yeah. he he shared it, and I I. Oh, you approved it. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that layout, though. So but can, what does Cuppers mean? What does Cuppers mean when he says he thinks it's not a good economic strategy? Like, it, but a good culture, but an econ a good economic strategy for whom is the question? Like, because like, it's like, yeah, like I, I agree, it would probably just worsen like the long term tendency for the rate of profit to fall. But it's like that itself would have 
but you know, could drive further revolutionary confrontation. And at the same time, just to have a UBI would ameliorate like a lot of the suffering associated with capitalism. So, you know, I mean, I, again, one, like, again, the arguments I find against it are often pretty bad. Another one I think is funny is when people say, oh, like, all, if we put in a UBI, everyone's going to come to our country, which is a funny argument because it's a bit like saying um, we shouldn't make our country too good because then everyone will <laughs> will come to it, which I think is a strange yeah. way of, you know, approaching the issue. Um, so yeah. I am, I, I am certainly, uh, and, and here, look, here's the thing, right? Like, you know, I don't think we're in an economic situation where it makes sense to, in any case, like, you know, they don't do this in China, they don't do anywhere. I don't, it doesn't make sense to, you know, nationalize, you know, the guy selling apples on the, on the street corner. You know, that's, that's not a good economic strategy. Well, also you can't because they are, you could say the ro the Robin Hood variable. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, that's already, this, the, that's already a proper term. That's already a God's term. Did this Robin Hood yeah. capitalism, John yeah, Connor um, variable. Guy on I don't the think street. it makes sense guy, to do guy that. On the street. Guy on the street. And the thing is, like, you know, people, he's, he's to, the way I look vendors. at it, to live, <laughs> I think I think we'll put it very simply. You can't give every, I think people should have, you know, a right to live under, under uh, you know, certainly under any dispensation that's so productive, that should be allotted as a right. Um, right. And I think that, um, you know, you can't provide everyone with, with their basic needs, right, without giving them money, because there are things that, you know, are very, very hard to render as national services. Right. Yeah. So I think is the moment you accept that that's the case, uh, then mm. I think that you, you have to accept that, you know, there should be some kind of supplement. Now, I want to differentiate here between a right UBI and a left UBI. Um, let's see what we got here by Ernesto. It's the book. Oh, OK, there the we go. On screen. Oh, look okay. at this. Wait a second. <laughs> that's that's a nice. Well, idea. That's pretty dope. Yeah. Yeah. We can I, do this we're, later. Not, we're not talking about this now, so I'll just pull. No, this I down, know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can just use um, it later. But but here here you got to differentiate between a right UBI and a left UBI. No, sorry, like finished. I I, I do have okay. another point about if, like. If you, uh, sure. If you if it. you a right a right UBI, if you look at it, it's like you know. So you have Milton Friedman, and he basically says like uh, it's very inefficient to give what he calls producer subsidies, um, which are subsidies to you know public enterprises. It'd be better, but but he acknowledges right because these guys were still close enough to Keynes, right? He's not a total madman. He's like, but we still have to have some redistributive mechanism. So that's why we should have like a negative income tax, right? Um, so that, you know, we're redistributing wealth, but we're redistributing in a society of private producers. So that to me is like a vision of like a right UBI. Um, you know, I think a left UBI is different because I think that what the idea of a left UBI is, uh, you know, is to, uh, you know, it doesn't preclude the possibility of other forms of, of producer subsidy. Right. So you can have right. government enterprises that are also doing that. But it's just mm -hmm. that it's just to acknowledge that there's a part of people's needs that's not going to be met through that. And again, a lot of the arguments are very bad. People will say it puts off the revolution. It's like, well, every social program puts off the revolution. People will say, uh, you know, it can be manipulated uh, by capital to to cut benefits. It's like, again, you can say this of, of all kinds of things. Right. It, it's also, very, it's very, very centered and, in terms of to create a universal of the quote unquote revolution in the U.S. on the, you know, the heart of capital. Um, first of all, I think you, I would say you have to keep in mind if there is a, if there is a movement uh, in the U.S., it will be towards democratic socialism. I would say I'm a, I'm a pessimist here. Um, I don't know. Things are uh, so crazy now. It's uh, yeah. Oh, I don't yeah. think. Yeah, I don't think. Point, yeah. uh, so, and second of all, I think there are real revolutions. Um, so I think it does a disservice to to think the U.S. will have a communist revolution. Because there are places that will have a proper communist, one-party leftist state communist revolution, right? Um, and those 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 areas are still in play. I would say it's not entirely impossible um, that the Philippines can be a one-party communist state. I would say it would be very difficult to to get um, people on board, but the makings are there mm -hmm. um, for that. There's an army. There's a radical, large communist army there. Um, I think it's not extraordinarily likely right now that they could simply take the state. Um, but, you know, that's there. Uh, in India, where fascism has taken hold, uh, to a certain extent, democratic, fa DFA, or DFI, democratic fascists of India. Um, <laughs> I like to call us Trump the DFA. Democratic fascists. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> he's, you know, I, I think it's not entirely, I think it's kind of unlikely because they, there's such an antagonism in the people against China to a certain extent. Uh, but there is a, there is like a large communist party in India, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
And then in these smaller authoritarian states, it's also very possible that the yeah. one party right wing state will flip to a one party left wing state. Um, well, Asia, 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 Asia is the strongest and, and, and we could talk about that. But but Nestor, yeah. do you have you want to say something? Do you, did you want to just get at that or? Oh, just like one final point, like regarding, you know, like the Robin Hood capitalism and like yeah. UBI, all that. But I think in a way, my point about like the specific difference with, um, you know, universal basic capital and or like property owning democracy and UBI, maybe it's like related to Robin Hood capitalism, if I'm understanding that correctly. Because like, in theory, you could have like a very generous well, Robin UBI. Hood socialism. Like, like there is a, I would say it's Robin Hood. Maybe so you could say Robin Hood socialism so, is this tendency to, I think, it, I, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like in the same register as Bonapartism. You could say where the, the idea that you can sort of just maybe Conrad would correct me here. Cause I'm sure it has a lot of technical underlines to it. Um, but where you sort of have this one person's going to go through and just sort of rush yeah, everything and it's going to and it's just going to work. Um, I think I think the Robin Hood socialism, which is which is sort of outlined in Z in the clinic, is of that sort of DSA value or the so you could say communist value set. Um, but how to do it um, within within the system? So it is it's kind of a depressing thing to. It's not exactly revolution yeah. inspiring, right? Um, or even you know participation inspiring. But I think in terms of when you are on the nuance channel, um, it's it's <laughs> it's the take it, it's the take. Uh, uh, yeah. Ender Wiggins says, "What would Marx think of UBI?" Well, judge by his record, Marx supported nearly every major uh, uh, reform like that. You know, public education, Medicare, and so forth. Um, I do think that um, you know he would have directly or indirectly. In fact, he, he already does this in his own way. He would have uh, delineated the limitations of what UBI could have achieved. So he would have he would have dismissed the possibility that it could represent like a uh, a magical cure to, the, to all the ills of capitalism. And he probably would have been a bit critical of the rhetoric of someone like Andrew Yang on that basis. Um, but I, I don't think that's to say that he would have opposed UBI. I'm quite certain. I, I don't know quite certain. I'm quite certain he would have uh, he would have supported judged by his other positions. Mm. So in that way, he, he really be? wasn't. So the Marxist and accelerationist rhetoric is not quite true in terms of the vulgar accelerationism. Um, he, he wasn't a vulgar accelerationist in terms of let the conditions get worse and let, say, let, let Trump get elected or whatever, and then capitalism will crash and it will radicalize people. Although it did definitely radicalize people. Um, mm. <laughs> the, problem right? with vulgar, the problem with vulgar accelerationism is it doesn't, it's not nuanced enough in the sense that it's not it doesn't um, yeah it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't perceive the 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 quantity quality relationship um, in terms of how revolutionary change is enacted so like you know if you look at what the ten like the tendencies Marx Marx is describing right you know in which um, you know what Marx is arguing is that um, you know there's going to be a revolution eventually because of the contradictions of capital but like also keep in mind that you know if these kind of reforms are arising they're also arising because of those contradictions. Right. So I think part of the error is to, you know, just put that stuff on one side and say that's reformism. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's like, for example, it's also those kind of reforms that can make that can depress the rate of profit. Right. To a level that, you know, uh, can trigger confrontations. Right. Um, so I think that Marx wasn't of the opinion that we have to oppose every reform. I mean, very clearly not. Right. Um, you know, I think he saw these kind of demands as being part of the imminent process um, through which revolution would be would be achieved. Right. Through which capitalism um, works works you know is exposed to its own contradiction if that makes yeah sense. well to go to the earlier chapters of capital that we covered in terms of uh the sort of very basic groundwork marx lays out in terms of why the capitalist class uh, and the labor class are in t conflict because you know eventually eventually you know it won't be able to the capitalist class won't be able to reproduce itself um if they sort of give into labor demand. So if, if we're stuck in the reform mindset, what we're really stuck in, in terms of if you are hypothetically, like I posit the U.S. to be in a sort of very you know, depressive way, um, <laughs> is a place where communist revolution won't happen um, because of such the, the radical right-wing force, which is armed in the U.S., I don't think is going away, um, and also capital forces. Uh, <laughs> that you're going to get this antagonism between labor 
and capitalism and the capitalist class wanting to push back against every single reform. But the, I think it's it's much, I think something to keep in mind here is what I said with the UBI argument in terms of whatever capitalist arguments are against these reforms hurting the economy. Keep deep like everything that the capitalist class does will affect the economy so much more than a basic labor reform or a basic income. Um, the idea that these reforms are going to somehow crash the economy rather than the fuck the games that capitalists play with credits or the joint uh, joint stock corporation um, is totally bonkers. It's right. just bullshit. It is, it's yeah. straight. It's straight up bullshit. Um, and that's something to keep in mind in terms of when you hear right wing people tell you that this reform will do this, this reform will do this because, and then they'll cite interpersonal or psychological, which is why there's such a pushback against psychology in general on the left, right. which I don't think is good either, obviously. Um, but there, the reason that exists is because this bit of rhetoric of interpersonal, psychological to econ econ economy crashes, all of that is used to obfuscate um, the capitalist classes I would say sole role of crashing this economy that we have. Um, it's not labor reform is not going to do that. Period. Capitalist hysteria of labor reform could do that in terms yeah. of like, <laughs> oh, this labor UBI got passed, so uh, I think this bullshit value of this corporation, is, so I'm going to sell all my socks at a really low price. Yeah, like, yeah hysteria could do that, um, but it's hysteria. It's it's the capitalist class hysteria. Uh, that drive like the reform itself is you know not the thing and i don't i don't think if ubi or something like that was implemented that the stock market would crash um, well it might can it might contribute to it might contribute to the to 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 a longer term like i said it would contribute to a longer term depression in the rate of profit but like that in of itself it wouldn't be like the, the single blow right you know and marx makes fun of that kind of rhetoric too like you know, okay, if they, you know, if we, if we regulate if we reduce the the working week by one hour a day that's the one that's the blow that's going to yeah. end all of capital. It's like we're looking at, at you know, longer term and more complex uh, kind of phenomena. As for as with respect to the possibility of revolution, um, I think that one of the one of the again, I don't think like you know you have organized left forces that are likely to uh, enact uh, uh, you know communist revolutions in most Western states. Um, one thing I do see though is I, I feel that um, you know if you look at uh, how China sort of progressed, right? One thing was like. You know, even in the Deng era, it was a bit more on the table, like, you know, are we going to converge with the West, um, you know, in terms of, you know, having a more liberal dispensation? Um, it really went, I think it really went the other way. Uh, you know, my take on, on history, maybe Elliot is a, a bit of a different account, but I just want to say that I think it really went the other way uh, after 07 away, right? Because, you know, uh, the West was, you know, th that called fundamentally into question the Western model, uh, but also there was, uh, you know, the West wasn't, uh, you know, capital wasn't being deployed as freely international, internationally to make these kind of investments, right? So China began establishing different priorities based on the consolidation and support of domestic firms, uh, you know, building up domestic demand and things like this. One thing I think that, that could happen uh, is that if, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, if America, for example, is, is fundamentally destabilized, uh, I think you could have uh, third world countries that inch closer and closer toward like a socialistic um, you know, uh, uh, dispensation because they don't, they're not being offered the same incentives right, in terms of investment, um, you know, in terms of pressure that can be wielded by international banking institute, like institutions and things like this uh, to, uh, you know, keep them uh, kind of in the liberal capitalist lane. Right. Uh, it's very interesting about Asia, by the way, because like, you know, I was Wait, reading. Can, we, can, and, I, can I address this first? Sure, or sure, yeah. you, you're in the middle of a point or is this a new, yeah. So do, doesn't UBI go directly to landlords, which makes property, more dependable, profitable, which raises property value, which accelerates the problem. So I think it's important to keep in mind, it's like, no, it does not go directly to landlords. It really goes to the people. Um, and there is there is a, you know, like I said, there's a the variation of the capitalist hysteria, which is how will capitalists react to UBI? Um, and it's it's not it's not defined. And that, go, that goes to my dad's theory of value, which is very counter to Marx's theory. Marx says labor is the source of value. My dad says bullshit is the source of value. <laughs> and I think he's correct in terms of there's a variable, which is capitalist hysteria does have, it's not value proper, but it, it affects price, right? Not value. Um, so it's like, you don't know what landlords will do always, but I'm sure some landlords will um, raise price. Some won't, right? 
Um, doesn't all so all it doesn't go directly to landlords? Yeah, all, doesn't all, re- all redistribution of wealth go to landlords? I mean, like if you make people's like you know, so the how ho- ho- like yeah. the health system in Canada costs like the the net the, co- the net cost is half per person of what they pay in the United States in their private system, right? So if we perform a kind of thought experiment, right, and I don't wish to, to suppose it's exactly the case, but if we perform a thought experiment where we suppose that you know in the form of um, you know, uh, paying less money in tax than you would, you know, in through private payments. Let's just say mm-hmm. that, again, abstracting, that every individual in the United States, or every individual in Canada, you know, gets that, right? Mm-hmm. That's going to allow people to charge more in rent, theoretically, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the argument about the specificity of UBI is that, like, it's being, you know, if it's going to low-income people, that a larger percentage of their overall income um, is directed toward rent. Um, but I'm just saying that it seems to me that in principle, any enrichment, right, could be through like legitimate work, right? Any enrichment of like that segment of the population, right, is going to have a consequent effect of uh, seeing cer- a certain elevation uh, of the of the rent to, to simplify. Right? Yeah. Well, Again, I mentioned could, there, there yeah, are ways I can't, of, I, yeah, so it's a bit so. of a weird argument. I think your your argument is probably it's it's solid in terms of you might see you might see a raising of the rent, which is pretty universalized in terms of there are universal tendencies of rent affected by these sort of macro changes and you can see that with COVID in terms of rent not going up in a lot of places uh, not being increased um some sometimes it's lowered other times they raise it and kick people out and then there's a riot um <laughs> they say fuck you you can you can also um, just have laws like you know like that's not that like i'm not saying those are those are devoid like those don't have any deleterious effects like yeah. i know in france for example like and it's partly important because they they have calf so because they give low-income people like uh they pay part of the rent. Um, they they combine it with rent controls. Now, one sort of perverse consequence of this is that um, because there's just because the the rents in Paris are artificially low, now like uh, landlords have invented like all this so these sort of hoops you have to jump through in order to get an apartment. Um, so like you have to have like a you know a guarantor who lives in France who has like high income, and then you have to like sh- share all this information about your job, and it's a way of uh, discriminating between candidates because there's actually um, you know at the rate that's set. Right, uh, the rate of the rent is not effectively serving in of itself to to uh, uh, diminish the number of people, the demand for that. Right, so that's what's mm-hmm. happening. Um, so there there can be negative effects like that, but I'm saying on the whole, I do think that what they have in a place like Paris is m- far preferable to what you get in London, right, where it's actually twice of pe- what Paris is, right, and yeah. you know that's that's what you're going to get toward if it's just you know, you know if it's just allowed to, you know, and that that's sort of what you have in New York, right. Where like from Giuliani, New York is crazy. Is like um, rent comparable to LA is like off the map. Like it's, um, it's like three thousand dollars a month stuff for like yeah. a kind of smaller apartment. Yeah. Um, in not you know not good areas either. Right. So. Well, Giuliani's whole Giuliani's whole also wages was like- wages wages are higher in a lot of places in New York. But then that also goes back to what is the minimum wage and who's the precariat. So technical positions like my my own position will be paid a lot higher in New York to compete with the housing supply and demand but nonetheless that just means the precarious or proletariat class are more and more sort of um sort of made made destitute you could say well i'm not an expert in new york city politics but it seems to me that one of the the obverse of giuliani's kind of uh plan to like clean up new york uh you know to make it like you know safe and like san- relatively sanitized and all of this part of this was just pricing people out of the market Right. Yeah. Like it was essentially like the embourgeoisment of the whole city. Right. So just allowing like the the uh, the, the private sector to adjudicate. Right. You know, private landlords and everything to adjudicate over that. Um, again, like one of the first things that people often say when they come to Paris. Right. You know, tourists, you know, they'll go to a certain area like, you know, where I live near Sacre Coeur, which is Barbaz, probably the worst metro in Paris, you know, and they're just like shocked by how, uh, you know, how much kind of like urban decay and poverty you see everywhere. And it's like, well, yeah, those things aren't good. But one thing that it does show is that the city is actually more accessible to live in, right? The not, you know, I, I said, you see this in London, like every surface is like spick and span clean, you know, and it's like, but again, rent is twice what it is in Paris, right? And then they don't have right. calf. So if you're lowing, what, what, it can so be you say it's twice, much. what is rent kind of like in London compared to, you say it's um, twice, but I like, I, yeah, I, I think guess I'd the, have to look at the rates. In, in, like, so I, to give you an idea, like I, yeah. I, so I rent a 15 square meter apartment in Paris. Yeah. Now for that, I pay uh, 600 euros, so like 600 American dollars, 630 American dollars about. Okay. Um, half that's paid by the government through CAF. So it's like 300. Oh, really? Yeah. It's now in, in London, you don't have CAF if you're lower income and it's about double. So that would be about, uh, it wouldn't, I don't know the exact rate on the pound, but that would be about 
1200 American dollars for a 15 square meter apartment in like the a relatively central part of London. Yeah. yeah. So that's that that really is getting that really is like a New York level, right? Because that's that is what you pay in New York, right? You pay like 1200 American for like a 15 square meter solo apartment, would you say? Is, is that low? <laughs> I think the depends, apartments. It depends, obviously. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think twelve hundred dollars in New York would be pretty low, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, well, I was. I I was in New York for like a year, and yeah, like, I stayed with a friend for like two weeks. She was paying, I think, twelve hundred or like fourteen hundred or something, and it was like a super really really small apartment shared apartment even so yeah right that's, well that, this is 15 square meters what i'm talking about in, in a poor in a bad neighborhood at that so i don't yeah. know that's still, exactly. that's still a high price i would say it is yeah yeah so i was i was saying my 600 is is 15 square meters yeah, yeah. in a bad neighborhood i was projecting that it'd be double in london um and, yeah. but again without the aid um and then i was projecting that 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 might be consistent with you know uh what did someone say here closer to 2k 1800 for a shithole. Yeah, so you get that. Yeah. There you go. I pay 300 for in Paris for what would cost you 18, 1800 to 2000 in New York. So if you want to ask yourself why New York, you know, is so wonderful and, and clean with all these, you know, sort of very sparkly people, uh, that might be part of the reason, right? Well, if you want a uh, cheap rent here in Mexico, it's about 150 to $200 a month. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, I would say it's difficult to find a 15 square meter apartment. The smallest apartment you see go here, I would say, is probably 45 square meters or for mm -hmm. conversion. Well, it's a different. It's a different city, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sure. I mean, of course. Of course. Yeah. It's not an island. Yeah. Did anyone read that article in, in LRB about uh, about about China? Uh, it was it was talking about the. Uh, anyone read this? It was interesting. It was whose century was the article? And it was mm -hmm. talking about from from mm -hmm. sort of a uh, an American liberal perspective um, or British liberal perspective, as the case may be. Uh, and it was basically talking about the uh, the failure of like the, the dislocation in American policy, where they were sort of like, oh, you know, if we have more economic cooperation with China, they'll inevitably become kind of more more liberal, more democratic. Um, you know, and they were talking about uh, the failure of that. But I thought one really interesting observation they made because we were talking about the third world. Uh, and, and the possibilities of revolutions in those contexts if the West isn't able to exert the same level of pressure. One thing it was saying was that, um, you know, in a way, like the Cold War was never won in Asia, right? You know, it's like right. America got, got beat in Vietnam, it was a stalemate in Korea, uh, and actually toppling the Soviet Union was largely contingent upon exploiting the Sino-Soviet split. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and they were saying like, well, you know, as the Berlin Wall was falling, you know, Tiananmen Square was, you know, China's response to the end of history thesis. <laughs> right, this was there. Um, yeah. So I do think I do think I do think that's very interesting too. I know there was another article on this, but I just wanted to say I think that's interesting because we often say, "Oh, the Cold War is over," uh, but it seems to me that you know if you look at at China's ascent, maybe that narrative should be reassessed. Uh, what do you think? What do you think, Nestor? Do you think do you think it's the same? Do you think the Cold War is over? Do you think it's a new war? Do you think it's a different war? What do you think? Nestor. No, I mean, like I, I think you're right about. Like that. <laughs> oh shit! No, I basically agree with Conrad about like oh, no, you know how the um, like the Cold War ending was like a very you know context specific um, kind of thing. Uh, but actually, like I w I also wanted to say something about like the Third World and you know like revolution and all that. Um, and I think Ernesto probably will agree. You know, like both of us living here actually in the third world. Um, I think, I don't know, like um, industrialized country media, and I this is maybe sort of a, like a contingent like side point, but I do think kind of like leftist media in, you know, the United States, the UK, whatever, often get a lot of things like very wrong about like the left in um, third world countries. Cause for example, here in Mexico, right? We have the first like left wing government in like pretty much ever, unless you count some of the like post, you know, revolution governments of the, like the early 20th century as left wing 
which, you know, that's, that's like a whole different discussion. But like in the democratic era, we just like elected the first uh, sort of like uh, openly like self-declared left-wing government. And there's a lot of like, for example, a lot of the, de- the of the government's policies are actually predicated around like austerity and just like, cause it's like, Oh, you know, we're in a time of crisis. So like we have to be like, um, it's immoral for the government to just like be spending and spending when like people, you know, don't have, um, you know, money to pay rent or whatever. And it's like this, sort of like very uh, moralistic discourse, um, which often translates to like, just, you know, like neo- neoliberal policy on steroids, like with extra steps, right? Of course. And it's, it's funny because like, you know, there's these two sides of the opposition to the um, government in Mexico. Part of it is just like, you know, kind of like the more reactionary sort of right wing uh, party, sort of like, you know, doing the whole uh, thing that they always do, like, oh, we're going to like become Venezuela and like we're going to like become communist and whatever. <laughs> and it's just like this, like extremely uh, inane, like stupid kind of critique of the government that will amount to nothing. Well, it's uh, also it obfuscates, you know, the number one factor, which is the capitalist class and what they're doing and the games right. they play with stocks and the jobs, right? Um, the idea oh, yeah. the, the idea that these basic reforms are like the, the guiding principle or even, you can almost say even a factor mm. um, to, to general economic sort of crash is just, is just not historically, you know, look at the last crash. Why did the last crash, they're like, what happened? No, but even like right. my point is that <laughs> there's this. Some of these reforms are not even happening. It's just like moralistic discourse, kind of. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, we get that a lot here in Mexico. Yeah, and so my 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 like the where I was going with that is that, for example, if you read I don't know uh, Jacobin or whatever kind of like American or British left-wing media and you read about like what's happening in mexico you would think like oh this is like a true left-wing government that's going to sort of like you know raise the level of uh livelihood for the working class and you know whatever and once you're here you realize that well like there's a couple of reforms that are kind of nice but you know not really and so like that makes me question whether like what i read about um, other sort of like left-wing governments in other uh, regions of the third world, like how accurate is that and how um, kind of... Well you, well, you need to nuance the reforms, right? You need to see what's like, who is who is offering this reform? Why are they offering it? Um, mm-hmm. what, what is the material effect on labor? And right, the proletariat right, because precariat for, for example, class, here in right? Mexico, one of our primary reforms is that we're getting a very... Uh, uh, we're getting a lot of stimulus, economic stimulus. And that economic stimulus comes because uh, our president and his cabinet that surrounds him, they all have ties to a lot of the of the capitalist class, right? So all they're doing is they're agilizing the, 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 the brokering of power, right? So they're saying, okay, so this part of Mexico that is, uh, you know, underdeveloped, this part goes to Humex. And Humex is going to develop that part and they're going to turn it into an actual profitable part of Mexico, which it's just neoliberal reforms. It's not left wing at all. It is it is intensifying the, the the labor force. It is making Mexico more profitable, but it's just entrenching us further. Into, what, what is it into, doing to, to wages? And um... we actually raised wages. Uh, we raised yeah. our minimum wage all, all around the country. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say I would say that it's uh, honestly. Uh, the it's, minimum wage is one thing. People get caught up in minimum wage. Um, well, well, here minimum wage is a it's a big thing because a lot yeah. of a, a lot a of lot of people are on minimum what, wage. I, what are the, 
wonder what the percentage or under is. yeah yeah because a lot of our uh labor force isn't even formally employed oh yeah yeah well it seems to me that the it seems to me that you know um a lot of uh you know and you see this with um um you know the organization of latin american states it, it seems to me that you know in in latin america and throughout much of the third world um you know the dominant ideology has been one of alignment with the west in order to uh you know encourage investment yeah. and so forth right right but it seems to me that it seems to me that you know you see the the major problems with this which as i said that the countries that develop are the countries that are able to build up uh you know uh, a domestic base right so they're not simply paying rents out to other countries relentlessly um yeah. you know and i think that a yeah, lot I mean, of these <clears throat> when you have highly sophisticated u.s firms entering into these environments you know a lot of the time um you know you're 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 going from a shift where you have like you know even even small localized kind of enterprises that can't seriously compete just being absorbed by these kind of behemoths right i think that you know uh what a government has to do um you know it has to be you know there has to be some kind of structural resemblance with what happened in china you know in terms of there being a lot of uh, uh state pressure right and, and capital controls being used to encourage domestic development but even mm -hmm. to take that position right you know as we know i mean I, I assume in mexico that would be like a radical left position right that would be almost yeah. un, that would be unsuitable in the context of the political status quo now hmm, maybe we have a, a strange history with that kind of politics because we're very proud of doing that kind of things with Lázaro Cárdenas, for example. So politically, it's not taboo. Well, and it's not. Though I'll okay. say one thing: like Lázaro Cárdenas, which she's when when I said like the post-revolutionary governments that might be called left wing, like he was specifically yeah. the guy I was referring to. Uh, but then that was also like pre Cold War, right? Um, and then like to go back to this like. Is the Cold War over? Is it not? Uh, yeah, I think Latin America is an interesting region to look at that. Because, um, you know, Latin America was always kind of part of this, like, non-aligned movement during the Cold War, you know, with, like, um, what was it, like, Thailand? Or what was, like, Sukarno? Uh, well, hmm. right. It was part of the non-aligned movement. Yeah, yeah. And, like, in a way, you can still see that, right? Because, like, I mean, there was, like, for example, it was, this is, like, the Pink Revolution that it was right. called, um, when a lot of kind of left-wing governments uh, won elections in, like, in Argentina and Venezuela, um, Bolivia, all of these countries. And, you know, some of them were, like, more to the left than others. But in the end, like... Even Venezuela, which is usually uh, thought of as the um, kind of like farthest left, is still it's still basically like a social democratic kind of just like big government Keynesian um, economy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, as far as I know, there's there's no actual like you know either like worker control of like capital or right. And, you know, technocracy is kind of a slur, and you hear a lot of technocracy in the context of um, capitalists sort of bulldozing workers and, and their, their sort of expertise. But technoc you know, technocratic, and, you know, Michael Brooks' comment, you hear, if you watched Michael Brooks, you know, rest yeah. in peace, Michael Brooks. Right. Um, but a lot of what he critiqued is technocratic neoliberalism, but it's important to realize to a certain extent that socialism, especially one party socialism, is technocratic. Yeah. It's, um, it's ruled yeah, by yeah. ruled by experts, right? Um, well, I mean, or, or I think council, even, councils. Like, like, yeah, say. I think even the word technocracy was like initially, like but, yeah, created to describe the Soviet Union. If I like, sure. And I and and so to go back to Venezuela, I wonder to what extent there is there are a sort of system of technocratic councils that have real say, or if it is this sort of one party, um, you know, I'd be interested. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not super familiar. I think I've been, you know, fully propagandized. And then one, you know, the, the crash of the petrol dollar, um, you know, and their failure has been largely painted as a failure of communism um, rather than a failure of one, one resource economy. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> you know, weird, weirdly enough. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not too. It might be worth revisiting what, what's happening. I, wonder, I don't know if you know, like, what the finer details of the Vene Venezuelan government layout. Uh, I know Zizek uh, has contempt for, you know. Like, I mean, it's oh, let's, let's be, like he says, let's make it, let's make this one, let's make this clear. South American communism has been a failure. It's like, no, it hasn't. Um, you know, well, yeah, he's, of, a bit, he's, a bit more, he's a bit more complex yeah. than that. Like, like in Cuba, like Zizek said that about Cuba, he said like, what, however great, like a moment this represents mm -hmm. for humankind. If you look at like, you know, the way when you go to Cuba today, it's like a kind of time portal into the past. One, right. you know, you would be, it would be mistaken to uphold yeah. that as some model that can really triumph in the future. Right. And I think Perfect. that's a fair, you know, and, and well, almost self-evident kind of thing. Yeah, but I mean, you know, Brazil did real reforms when, but that is, that is de democratic socialist, right? Or social democratic. Yeah, and well, but no, I now. think they would, they would, they, they had socialist reforms, and now they're, you know, the fascists have taken yeah. power. DF, DFB, Democratic Fascists of Brazil. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but have have taken power, but you know, there have been. There have been gains, um, and going back, going back to Bro uh, Michael Brooks's work that he did do, um, and if you watch the Zero Books tribute to Michael Brooks, uh, they mention this and they sort of cite how he was talking about uh, Brazil, and he was like the only person who was like very insistent about talking about uh, Brazil mm -hmm. um, in particular, um, and sort of going and you know before that I did see Michael Brooks's interview with uh, the Brazilian, Brilliant. yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of what he cites, in terms of bringing, like we, you know, Mexico minimum wage is still less than a dollar. You know, they yeah. raise minimum wage. So in the U.S., we don't have really, we don't really conceive the problems of of, the, of other countries uh, yeah. in a lot of ways. In terms of like bringing electricity to millions of people, it's like, what do you mean? Like what? Um, right. So bringing bringing a standard of living with appliances so people have appliances which, which is, so which is also have, still a problem right? in the united states it's that is that is a problem in the united states to some degree but i would say it's not quite the problem i like what i know of and this is working i would say i work with the most marginalized population in the united states not not i don't mean it doesn't exist in every city but i work with the population their problems aren't electricity um, like Conrad said earlier, and much to Conrad's credit, um, the problem is money. Uh, people people are on GR. GR is two hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. um, even when they do have very precarious housing, you know, often with you know a relative of a relative or with like five other people in a very small space, ultimately there is electricity. Uh, but you know, in Flint, you have you have places like Flint. You know, it's like suddenly you can't get clean water and then everyone dies. Um, but there's, you know, versus Brazil, which is like people need to get in large amounts the basic sort of setup of housing. And also the U.S. has problems, which you could say they don't maybe in a lot of, uh, in a lot of spaces in terms of the surrounding of, of the, you know, they say inner city, right, to a certain right. degree versus a sort of, uh, it's it's not quite only inner city. It's sort of like generalized. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, technology needs to reach in certain places. Um, versus, like when you are in an inner city environment, it mean, what it means is you are surrounded by a higher where, by where your money doesn't function. Your money does not. If you make two hundred dollars a month, you can't really leave. You know, um, so it makes a problem. Given people get out, like the interpersonal psychological, people do get out. But I'm just saying, there's a large contingent. So we don't we don't have the same problems with Brazil mm -hmm. uh, regarding getting appliances or getting electricity in, in the most marginalized cases. Of um, but what you but what you do have is the problem of money, the simple problem of money, which is you know, people living oh, you know, living off a of very very low income or one person's income or being finding it very difficult to get employment. And then people who are you know educated they see. Well, you know, if you only went to this and this and this, you'd be able to get employment. But a lot of people, you know, it's not necessarily possible for various reasons. Right? Could I? Could I? Before we, we're coming up on time here, but could I just recommend yeah. quickly a book? Um, I just uh, I just picked up and read in a couple days uh, a book by uh, David Halal Rubin called Marxism and Materialism: A Study in Marxist Theory of Knowledge. It's from 1979. 
Uh, I highly uh, recommend it. Uh, just to say mm -hmm. in the book, uh, it's, it's, you know, everybody criticizes like, you know, Lenin reflection theory, right? Uh, you know, empiricism and material criticism. Um, or is it materialism and imperial criticism? I always get those mixed up. Anyway, um, in the book, uh, uh, Hillel Rubin, who's kind of an English analytic Marxist, and normally I hate that stuff, um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he basically, he basically just to say he defends the need for some kind of correspondence theory of knowledge in Marxism, because, you know, and it, it, it's interesting, like what he argues is just that we, you, you don't necessarily have to have a theory of, of reflection, right, or, or kind of imagism, like what Lenin suggests uh, in mm -hmm. his text, um, but that uh, you ultimately, you, there's no way of establishing like a criteria of adequation um, from uh, 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 from in, a totally internal perspective, right? This is a problem you find in the work of Althusser as well. So he argues that whether you accept directly the contents of Lenin's work, whatever its vulgarities, one thing that Lenin identifies very, very well is the way that any materialist theory, right, uh, has to argue that knowledge uh, finds its basis, uh, you know, uh, in the external world. That doesn't mean that it won't necessarily be conditioned in other ways, but that there has to be a, a kind of external referent of knowledge. Um, so very, very interesting uh, little treatise on epistemology, uh, which I recommend you guys if you're interested. Um, are we good to, with two hours, are we good to shut down now, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I is this the book? So. Sorry. The book is called, uh, the book is, is called the Marxism. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's the book there. And you can you can pirate that too if you go right over to Library Genesis. <laughs> oh, uh, okay, so, yeah. Perfect. Uh, cool. Yeah. That's so you how you know this, that. this is the place of knowledge. It's not LibGen. Library Genesis. I had no idea that's what LibGen stands for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And um, so we'll be back. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, I'm going to be busy next week. But we'll be back on August 9th. Uh, and then With we're going to. Special guest, special guest, uh, Justin Murphy. Yeah, the based <laughs> god, uh, Justin Murphy, uh, will be here. And, uh, we're gonna, and then him and Conrad will be in the same room. And, you know, maybe the world, like the Hadron Collider theory. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see we're what all happens. looking to be extremely uh, enlightened by, by Justin Murphy. Uh, it'll be like oh, if the boy. angel Gabriel coming down to earth and telling us the truth of the meaning of life. Um, but anyway, uh, for next week, uh, we're going to be... Uh, going through the fifth section of chapter 25, the general law of capitalist accumulation. Uh, and to do that, we'll be reading from page 802 to page, what do we got here? What's the exact page? 802 to what? Have we got that? Mm -hmm. Eight, 802 to eight, one second. I don't have the physical book, so it takes a minute. 802, 870. 870. 80, 802 to 870. So, Those will be the pages. Okay, yeah, we'll be you reading. can see that. Yeah, 802 to 870. Uh, so, and Justin Murphy will be here uh, for better or for worse. Uh, so we hope all you guys uh, are going to tune in in August 9th. That's two weeks from now. We're taking taking a week off. Give yourselves a week off. You know, it's hard to read Capital with us. You know, with our nuance, you know, it can be very tiring. We're um, almost done, though. Yeah, it's we're almost done. Then we're going to move on to our Chinese, uh, you know, uh, to our to our Chinese uh, uh, socialism, <laughs> socialism with Chinese characteristics group. And by Perfect. the way, I think, I think, it's, I think it's, we should... Uh, we should dedicate this episode to, to, to Michael Brooks, the memory of Michael Brooks, uh, who are all, uh, you know, very, very tragic uh, personally, but also for the sort of incipient left uh, media apparatus. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Uh, any, any, anyone have anything to say before we shut down? Uh, I just wanted to say, like, speaking of the book that you just recommended, like, I know this is like a capital reading group, but we should totally do like a special episode on epistemology and we can do that. that kind of thing. Cause, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. And I, maybe, also, maybe after we finish Capital, we can we can take that on. Yeah. Also, when we do get to these Chinese works, I think a good framework is not to stay, uh, sino fixated, and in terms of relating it to uh, sort of international issues as well. So we could read we could read through Marx, you know, through the lens of Capital, which we just went through, uh, which they don't do in China, uh, mm -hmm. in the Marxism departments. Um, they don't they don't bring in Marx. You mean, you mean the uh, you mean the mandatory courses? You don't mean the actual academics, but. Oh, uh, that's that's just what I hear from Burgess, um, who was invited over to China to talk about um, Marx, and then they're like, "Oh, where's your? Let's talk about Marx." And they're like, "We don't talk about Marx." Um, <laughs> so, I, mean, I don't think that's a universal thing. I mean, like, I, it might not be universal, but um, but we'll be talking about Marx and yeah. Chinese socialism, and well, and I think we're bringing international issues as well. So we'll we'll bring in a very gulag. We'll, we're going to make a very gulagable. Um. 
uh, show. So that'll be perfect. Exciting. Perfect. Yeah. Well, that'll be okay for Ellie because as as we've heard, if he gets if he gets gulagged, he'll get the nicest room, right? He'll get the the, the glass get... pane in front of the in front of the waterfall, right? Um, the, the, <laughs> the the bulletproof glass pane, unbreakable. I'm not totally against like you know. I'm not you know what's happening to the Uyghurs and, and in labor over there is bad. Um, and it's it's bad culturally um, to 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 isolate a culture and systematically eliminate it. Um, I would have a different response to being forced to learn Chinese. I would probably be like, I have to learn Chinese. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, Elliot, Elliot's throwing down with me here. We got to close the episode, so we'll talk yeah, about yeah, that well, more later. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. But thanks all, you guys, thanks all you guys for coming out. Thanks, Nestor, a lot for coming out. We always appreciate your your contribution so much. Um, and we'll be back here in two weeks. That's two weeks, not next week. Two weeks. On August 9th with, yeah. uh, you know, the uh, the uh, most authoritative, intellectual, titanic, concentrate of our time, uh, Justin Murphy. So see you guys uh, on August 9th. Bye. So long, everyone. Bye, guys.